Okay. So I want to start by talking about the cell theory, the cell theory. Okay. You have to know the cell very, very well, everything about the cell. Okay. So remember that all organisms contain one or more cells okay, that are capable of carrying on the life activities of the organism, you know, and the cell theory says that the cell is a unit of structure in all living things. Now, the cell is a unit of function of all living things, and all cells come from pre-existing cells. So it means that you need a cell to form another cell, right? So that's the basic the cell theory. And one thing I have to know that viruses are not typical cells. Viruses are not typical um, cell, uh, cell. They don't have the typical cell structure, right? So we don't consider them as um, like a typical cell, okay? Now, what do you have to know about a cell? I broke this down a little bit here. Now the cell, if you take the cell, the cell has the outer covering. Okay, so the outer covering is the cell membrane. You have the cell membrane around it. And then if you take out the cell membrane, then you have the portion in here, which we call the, the protoplasm. Okay, the protoplasm is everything in here. Oh, if you take out the cell membrane, it's a protoplasm, the content here, okay? So the protoplasm is made up of the cytoplasm. So this is the cytoplasm. And then you have the nucleus in there. So this will be the nucleus. Okay, so the protoplasm is made up of the nucleus and the cytoplasm. So you have to know that, right, those two things. Okay. So if you take out the nucleus, they have the cytoplasm. Okay. Okay. Great. So on the test, you have to know the structure of the cell and the functions. Know this very, very well. Know this very, very well. Structure of the cell and function. They'll always ask a lot of questions on, on this. Okay. And then, so that's why I have this here for you. Function of some cell organelles. All the small, small structures that you have in there are called organelles, and organelles like small, small organs. Okay. So let's begin by looking at the functions of the organelles in the cell. So the first one I want to look at is the nucleus, the nucleus. Okay. So once you see the nucleus, remember that the nucleus is a control center of the cell, right? It contains the DNA. So any question that you have DNA, you know, it should be related to the nucleus in there, in the nucleus. Okay. So nucleus, keyword, DNA in there, DNA. Okay. DNA. And then what is the function of the DNA? The DNA directs a synthesis of protein within the cell, right? It contains the genetic material, uh, our genes. Okay. We'll talk a little bit about DNA um, later. And then you have around the DNA, sorry, around the nucleus, you have a structure that looks like this. I like a lot of interactions. So sometimes I ask you what you think certain things are. Okay. And there are some fine particles on it like that. Okay. Now, what do you think this structure is? Those particles on anybody? Ribosomes. Ribosomes, correct. So those are ribosomes. So you have to know about the ribosomes. Right. 
ribosomes. And what are the functions of the ribosomes? It makes proteins. Protein synthesis. Good. Protein synthesis. So once you see ribosomes, quickly think about protein synthesis in the question, right? So we have a ribosome found on the endoplasmic reticulum. And it's also free within the cell that it can be free or bound, right? They're responsible for synthesis of protein in the cell. So protein synthesis, that's the key. When you see ribosomes, protein synthesis. Okay. All right. And then the structure that you find that on is the endoplasmic reticulum. There are two types. One is rough because of the presence of ribosomes. Okay, so this is a rough endoplasmic reticulum. Endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, so what is the function of the rough ER? We call it RER, rough ER. What's the function, anybody? Transport the protein. Yeah, transport proteins. So keyword transports proteins. Proteins. Okay, that's a function. So protein is produced by the RNA, sorry, the ribosomes. The ribosomes, um, the, for, for the ribosomes, the protein will go into the endoplasmic reticulum that transports the protein within the cell, okay? So that's a rough one. Uh, if there's a rough one, that means that there should be a smooth one somewhere. So let's draw the smooth one somewhere here. So the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, they don't have ribos uh, ribosomes on the surface. So they appear smooth. So that's a smooth ER. So what's the function of the smooth ER? Anybody? Anybody remember it's function of the smooth ER? The storage of enzymes and folding proteins. Uh, well, basically if the smooth ER, they are involved in protein lipid synthesis, lipids, right? So lipid synthesis. So let's put that down, lipid synthesis. Right, so if we see a question that has to do with protein synthesis, you, your mind should go to smooth ear, right? A question like this, you know, somebody's looking at the cell and the person notices that the cell has a lot of smooth endoplasmic reticulum. What is the likely function of this cell or tissue? What's the likely function, right? So quickly, your mind has to go to something that has to do with lipid synthesis. Okay, All right. So that's some of the ways that somebody asks you the questions. So it's not always like, what is the function? What's the function of that? It can come in a scenario form, like the way I put it, you know, and by sure to say this is um, the function. Okay. All right, good. So the other more structures that I'm gonna put here, let's put one here. The famous sausage shaped structure looks like sausage. And that's the mitochondrium. So when you see the mitochondrium, what comes into your mind? Energy. energy, right? So energy production. So we're going to write ATP, which is the energy currency. So ATP production. Energy, right? That's how we store energy. Okay. So once you see mitochondrium, the question should be related to ATP. Anything with ATP, think of mitochondrial. So that's how the, your mind should be working for the exam when they ask you functions or the, or, or the um, of that organelle, right? Sometimes they'll give you the diagram, then they'll label they'll label them one, two, three, four, five, and so on. Then they ask you which structures label one, 
you know, and what's the function and so on. So let your mind work uh, like that, you know, or it can be in a scenario form. Okay? There are more structures that we can put in. I'm gonna put in another one that looks like, um, like plates. Okay, that'll be the gorgy apparatus. Or some people call it a gorgy body. So what's the function of gorgy, gorgy apparatus or gorgy body? Or packaging. Packaging, correct. The keyword is packaging. So it's the packaging center. So it packages the protein that is formed. Packaging of protein formed. Okay, so if you remember that, you are, you're good to go. Packaging of proteins that is formed, you know. So the whole thing is like a factory. Ribosomes produce a protein, goes to the endoplasmic reticulum, then the endoplasmic reticulum will pass it on to Golgi apparatus where it is modified. So another word is it modifies the protein, right? Packaging means modify the protein before the protein goes out of the cell. Because some of the proteins have become enzymes, you know, hormones and other things. Okay, so it may add some lipid to it or some uh, carbohydrate to it and so on before it leaves the cell. It packages it nicely before it leaves the cell. Okay, so remember that's the packaging center. And then another thing that you're gonna have here, I'm gonna put another structure in there. That'll be the lysosomes. Lysosome. So the lysosome, it contains enzymes, hydrolytic enzymes, enzymes that break down substances within the cell. So you have hydrolytic enzymes. They break down substances within the cell. Okay. All right. So these are some of the structures that you see in the cell that is good to know um, about. Okay. If sometimes some cells will have things like um, vacuoles and other things, you know. But I'm going to leave that out. Not every cell has that. But you have vacuum, vacuoles. Uh, usually, they are like spaces that contain fluid, or you know, or maybe like fluid containing the digested food substances and so on within the cell. Okay, um, something like amoeba has what we call contractile vacuole in amoeba. Amoeba is a one-cell organism. Okay, and the contractile vacuole helps to um, helps it to store waste. It helps them to store waste. Okay. So what I've described so far, it's basically um, common to well, most cells. We have animal cell and they have plant cell, right? So these are like common structures, but the animal, the plant cell has some additional structures which I'm going to mention. You have to know the difference between the animal and then the plant um, cell. We're going to talk about that sh shortly, because it also comes on the test. Okay. Now, one main thing that I want to highlight before we continue is a cell membrane. Cell membrane. So if you look at a cell membrane, we didn't talk about that. But when you mention a cell membrane, one thing has to come into your mind, and that is it's a semi-permeable membrane very important to remember that semi-permeable membrane okay yeah semi-permeable because it allows only certain things to go in and out of the cell not everything can go in so it's a gateway controls what goes into the cell okay and i believe you all know how the cell membrane looks like you know it's made up of like a, a bilipid layer so this is a bilipid layer by lipid layer, okay. And then you have some proteins going in and out of it. I'm gonna draw it here for you to see how it goes. So the structure, like lipid structure, usually we use like a head and tail. In chemistry, it has a lot of carbons where the tail is, you have a lot of carbons. And then the head, you have what we call phosphates. Okay, so it's a phospholipid, it's a bilipid layer. So this phospholipid. Okay. 
Okay. So the lipid here, these are phosphate parts, which you call the head phosphates. And then the tail portion is the lipid layer, the fat layer, fat parts. Okay. So that's what I got phospholipid. Now phosphate is hydrophilic, it likes water. Whilst lipid doesn't like water, so it's hydrophobic, philic and phobic. Okay. So because it's hydrophobic, it means that the lipid has to hide itself. There's water outside the cell, the water inside and outside the cell, right? So the lipid hides itself in the middle. That's why it's a double layer, like a sandwich. Lipid will be hiding inside because you have water inside and outside, you know. So it's going to look something like this. Two lipid layers of phospholipid. The lipid hiding inside. Okay. So how do things go through the cell? Um, there are proteins on the surface. You have some proteins on the surface. You have a protein. These are proteins. And they have some proteins that are on inside the cell. And there's some proteins that go throughout the entire cell. So they go in and there's a, there's a space in there. So this is like another protein with a channel in there. Right, so those on the outside act as receptors. Sometimes those are inside act as enzymes. And these are the protein channels. Okay, these are protein channels. That's where substances can go in and out. Like water can go in and out through it there, protein channels. Okay, so that's how the cell membrane looks like, semi permeable. So, this is a quick overview of how the cell, general cell, looks like. Okay, you know. So, let's go back to the notes here. Okay, so this is a summary of all that I've said. No. And the plasma reticulum transport, transport channels within the cell, they transport proteins. Food vacuole stores and digests food. We have food vac contractor vacuole. Contractor vacuole, you see that it pumps out waste and excess water from the cell. Okay, and then the cell membrane is selectively uh, permeable. In other words, selectively regulates the materials moving in out of the cell. Okay, good. So that's a quick overview of how the cell looks like. Okay. So key points that you have to know. I've put that in a box. Difference between plant cell and animal cell. A quick overview of that. Now, if you see central and centrosome in a question, right? I want you to think of animal cell. You find them only in animal cells central and centrosomes, right? Um, they are involved in, when the cell is dividing, they form what are called spindles, you know, that helps in the cell division. Um, it only occurs in animal cell. So any question that you see this, you should think about that. So a question like somebody's looking at the microscope and observe that the cell has um, central or centrosome, which are the following is a person looking at? Then they give the options, maybe an onion cell, mango cell um, and so on, cat cell, strawberry cell. Then you, know, you quickly know it's animal, okay. or you only find animals, okay? All right. And then if you see cell plates, now cell plates here and chloroplast, cell plate and chloroplast. Cell plates is what becomes the cell wall. Plants have cell wall, right? Animals cell don't have cell wall. So cell wall is another thing that you should think about. This is cell wall somewhere, only plants. And a cell plate becomes a cell wall when the cell is dividing in plants, right? So cell plate is only in, animal, I mean plants. And then chloroplast, you will see chloroplast. Chloroplast is also only in plants, only in plants. Because the chloroplast, they contain chlorophyll. 
your chlorophyll is the green coloring substance or pigment in the plants. Okay, so these are a few things that you have to know, you know, especially if you have to answer questions on the cell, the differences, plant and animal cells. Okay. Any questions so far on the animal and the plant cell? This is a quick overview of it. Any questions? So far, so good. Okay. So point number nine, chloroplast. We have said that already, found only in plants and algae, contains chlorophyll, which is a color, the green coloring substance in the plant. It carries out photosynthesis. Okay. Then we mentioned cell wall. I talked about that already, all in plants. The cell was formed from the cell plates during cell division. Okay. All right. So all that I said described this what I was talking about, a typical animal cell. Okay. okay, great. So with that knowledge, we'll delve into movement across the cell membrane. Movement across the cell membrane. Now, this is also very important um, to know movement across the cell membrane. Okay. Every time they ask a question on that one, it's something he always. So know all the different movements. Okay. Now the first one we want to talk about is a diffusion, diffusion or passive transport. You know, some people call that simple diffusion. That's another word that people use, simple diffusion. Simple. Diffusion. So if you see all those words, they mean the same thing. Okay. So simple diffusion is the movement of materials from a region of higher concentration to a lower, a region of lower concentration. Right? That's simple diffusion. Uh, example: when you open like a, a bottle of perfume, um, the scent spreads throughout the whole room, right? So that is simple diffusion. And, and then if you have a drop of ink placed in a cup of water, the ink will spread throughout the whole water by simple diffusion, right? So one way you can remember diffusion, it's to think about this diagram. Let's say I have a room and then I have a lot of molecules in here and few molecules here, so crowded room. Now, because the room is crowded, the people want to move out into a less crowded environment. So that is simple diffusion, right? Crowded to less crowded. So if you think of the scenarios, the, the bottle of perfume, you have the molecules concentrated here, few molecules outside, so it spreads out, simple diffusion. Same with the ink, if I take the red dye, I take water with the ink here, let's say red ink. The molecules of the ink are concentrated here in the, in the drop, so it spreads out, it spreads out. Okay. So that is simple diffusion. In this case, no energy is needed. You don't need any energy, okay, no energy needed. So keep that in mind, simple diffusion. And then know the scenarios. They, they give these different scenarios that I've given. You know, I, I'll give a lot of examples like this so that you know how sometimes the questions go. Different scenarios like this. You know. Another example would be like breathing. <laughs> Oxygen goes from the atmosphere into the lungs by simple, uh, what do you call it, uh, diffusion. And then we breathe out carbon dioxide also by simple Diffusion and so for more common design inside than outside, so it moves out. Simple diffusion. Okay. So the keyword high to low. Then we have active transport. Point number two. Now active transport is a movement of molecules from a region of lower concentration to a region of higher concentration in which energy is needed. So here you need energy, and the energy comes from ATP. Okay. So it's almost like backwards type of thing. So few molecules here, you have more molecules on the other side, but then 
the molecules are moving from the lower to the higher concentration. You know? So I use this like a crowded room. You have a crowded room and you have people outside, people outside the room. They still want to go into the room. So what happens? You've got to push them in, you've got to force them in. You know? So how do you do that? You need energy. So energy is needed to move the molecules from a region of lower concentration to a region of higher concentration by right? using energy. So the keyword is ATP, energy. And what's an example? An example is sodium. Sodium is pumped out of the cell by active diffusion. You have more sodium outside the cell than inside. So sodium goes from like during um, movement, sorry, during uh, electrical transmission of impulse along the nerve. Sodium rushes into the, into the, the neuron, the nerve. Now afterwards, it has to be pushed back outside and that needs energy is an active process. Likewise, potassium goes out and it has to move back into the cell. So it also needs energy to push them back. Yes. We are pushing against what we call a concentration gradient. Okay. So energy is needed. So these are some examples of, of it. Okay. And then number three, osmosis. You have to know what osmosis is osmosis. So osmosis is a flow of water molecules from a less concentrated solution. So you have less concentrated solution as a keyword here. Another word for that is called hypotonic solution to a higher concentrated solution, which you call the hypertonic, hypertonic solution through a semi-permeable membrane. This is very important. You need to have a semi-permeable membrane. If you don't have that, there cannot be any osmosis because the semi-permeable membrane selectively allows only the water molecules to go into the cell. So it's very important in the definition to have semi-permeable membrane. Okay. So, the, so the water molecules move from less concentrated to a more concentrated solution through a semi-permeable membrane. So this is a very simple experiment that can be done in the house. If you take, let's say potatoes, and then you make it into a cup, like scoop the inside and turn into like a cup. So I'll call it a potato cup, potato cup. And then you have a dish or a plate of water. So put water in a bowl or in a plate. And then in the potato cup, put in like salt solution here. So solution, salt solution. You can get this set up as a question. What's gonna happen after some time, like some few hours? If you come back some few hours, you're gonna realize that the level of water here in a potato cup will go up. It's going to increase. Yeah. All because the water will move from the hypotonic. So this water is, is hypo. Less, there's no salt in here. So hypotonic. And this one is hyper. So the water molecules move from low to go, go inside. So the level would increase over there. This osmosis, the potato cup is acting like a semi-permeable membrane. It is semi-permeable. Semi-permeable membrane. So that's a potato cup. That's what it's doing. Okay. So if you see this setup in a question, we are dealing with osmosis. Okay. Um, a, a typical way in which they draw this, sometimes they'll draw like a tube. They'll draw like a tube like that. I think you may see that question somewhere in a book. And then they put a membrane, they tell there's a membrane here. And then they have put this in water. Then they have salt solution in there. Like this, salt here. And then there's water here. And then they ask you after some time, what happens to the level of water in this tube? 
you know. And then she wants to say it, it goes, it rises, like goes up, the level increases. Yes, that's osmosis. Okay, right. Okay. All right. So when it comes to the body, a typical example of um, osmosis occurring is when you put like you take red blood cell and place it in water. Okay, if you take a red blood cell and place it in water, the water will flow into the cell, right? Because you have more dissolved salt in the red blood cell. Okay, so it's going to swell up and eventually to rupture because this red blood cell cannot swell up forever. So it will burst. Okay, so that would be um, an example of osmosis occurring. Um, if you put the red blood cell in less like, salt solution, then the opposite will occur. You have water moving <clears> from <throat> the red blood cell into the salt solution, right backwards, right? So in that case, the red blood cell is going to shrink and so on, okay? So remember some of these examples, it will create, okay? And another example is water flowing from the soil into the root of plants. The root of plants is also by osmosis. You have dissolved salt in the roots. So the root you know, ends up drawing the water into it. Okay, osmosis. Okay. So those are examples of osmosis. And then the other example, other, other um, type of movement is facilitated diffusion. Okay, point number four. Facilitated diffusion, you know, certain, you see, um, certain molecules can move into the cell freely, you know, by simple diffusion. Okay, so what happens are as they go into the cell, they create the opportunity for other substances to uh, follow them, right? You know, so in other words, I say that they've assisted other mole mole other mo other molecules to go into the cell. You know, so that is. Uh, facilitated diffusion. Okay, you know, some of them need what we call carrier proteins. It might help them. The carrier proteins help to take the substance into the cell. So something's helping to carry the substance into the cell. Okay, facilitated diffusion. Um, a typical example is glucose. Right, glucose cannot go into the cell uh, freely, but sodium can go into the cell easily. So as sodium goes into the cell it creates opportunity for glucose to follow it, you know? So you always need a sodium or glucose uh, to go into the cell. Now, this is very important once you start your clinicals. Your clinicals, um, and somebody comes in with what we call diabetic ketoacidosis, you know, ketoacidosis. They are like in high blood they have high um, blood sugar and they go into uh, coma. You know, those with diabetes, sometimes it happens, it's all controlled well. And so when it come, you don't just go in and start giving them uh, what you call insulin. If you get start doing that, they're gonna die. So what you have to do first is to make sure they are well hydrated. You hydrate them very well. And when you're hydrating them, you give them normal saline. You have to use normal saline. Because normal saline, so to increase the amount of um, sodium in the blood. Because once that is corrected, then you can give them insulin because now you have enough sodium to help the glucose in the blood to go into the cell, you know? Okay, so once you start doing clinicals, forget that this is an example of facilitated diffusion, you know? That's a typical example of that, why that is done, okay? And then the last one is endo endocytosis, endocytosis. Endocytosis, this is a process by which the cell engulfs or captures substances into the cytoplasm, right? Cytoplasm. And there are two types of endocytosis. There are two types. So let's go quickly over that one. We have what we call um, pinocytosis and they have phagocytosis, two types. Now, pinocytosis is like cell drinking, like if you translate it literally. It means cell is drinking like drinking, okay? In other words, the cell engulfs a liquid substance, right? While phagocytosis, literally speaking, means cell is eating, right? In other words, the cell engulfs or takes in a solid substance, something that's solid for, okay? So if you take the cell, like amoeba, for example, so the cell 
or even the, the neutrophil. So the cell sees a substance like this. If it's solid, then it's phagocytosis. If it's liquid, then it's um, pinocytosis, pinocytosis. So it sees this, then to send part of the membrane around it. So it comes like, and then to capture it, you know. So this will fuse together. And then you have this substance in the, in the cell like that. Okay, so this is what forms the vacuum. So if it's food, then for the food vacuum and so on. Okay. So that's endocytosis, taking in something. Okay. Solid, phago, liquid, pino, or pino. And the exocytosis is when it pushes the substance out, it gets to the substance. So it's like this one, like back going backwards and pushes it out like this, backwards. Okay. So those are the type of movements that you should be thinking about for this test, movement across the cell membrane. Try and know each of them and the examples. When they ask you, you know what you're talking about. Okay, um, any questions so far on these few examples? Anybody has a question before we move on? Okay. okay, so I believe we'll, everybody's fine so far since there's no question. Okay. All right, there are no questions, then let's move on to um, organization of the organism, how we're going to organize. Okay. Now we have like starts with like the atom molecules and so on, right? And eventually we'll start with this, we form the cell. So the cell, we have a group of cells that function together. You have tissue, a group of tissues that have similar function, they form an organ and so on. And the different organs put together, you have what you call organism. And that's the level of organization. Okay. So we have here the simplest level of organization is that of the cell. A group of cells with similar functions called a tissue. Example, epithelia, nervous, muscle, connective tissue. And a group of tissues working together to perform a common function, we call that an organ. For example, the heart is an organ made up of nervous, muscle, and other tissues. Okay. Then we have a group of organs working together to perform a common function, we call that, we refer to that as a system or the organ system. Okay. Uh, for example, circulatory system is made up of the heart, the blood vessels, and the blood. There are many different organs systems uh, that function together to allow a complex organism to exist in life. You know, then you have the whole organism being formed. Okay. So this, this is a level of organization. Okay. So let's look at some of the tissues, the type of tissues that we have. Okay. So the first type of tissue, it's the epithelial tissue, epithelial tissue or the epithelium. Okay. Now the epithelium, the, the, the tissues that line or cover body surfaces, we call them epithelium, epithelial tissues. Right? And what are the types? How do you classify them? Uh, classification is can be based on the shape. So to classify this, we can do classification. It can be based on the shape, how they look like. And then we can also classify them based on the number of layers. Number of layers. Okay, right. so if you have um, only one layer, we call that simple epithelium. So simple epithelium, and then you have what we call stratified. 
epithelium, simple and stratified. Okay, so simple means only one layer. Stratify means more than one or many layers, okay. Multiple layers. So based on the shape, it is how we classify them. We have squamous epithelium. Squamous epithelium, they are flat cells. So for every epithelium, we have what we call a basement membrane. Try and know the shape, the shape. I has, the way I'm drawing it, you can get a diagram like that. This is called a basement membrane basements okay so the basement membrane is what the cells rest on all right so the cells will be like flat cells resting in the basement membrane and then the nucleus will be the long as it's a nucleus is parallel to the base the basement membrane like like that that flat cells they have a squamous. Okay, so if you draw a diagram that looks like this, you should have a squamous membrane, squamous epithelium. And then for cuboidal, you have the basement membrane, and the cells will be like cubes, all the size like equal. And the nucleus will be like round. So if you see that, you're dealing with cuboidal epithelium. And then columna. Columnar like pillar, column pillars. So the basement membrane, and then you see the cells, tall cells, several times taller than the width. And then the nucleus, the as it's the long as the nucleus will be like perpendicular to the basement membrane, so like this. All right. So we see these structures. They are dealing with columnar epithelium okay um it's good to know where you find some of these things all right good to know like squamous epithelium thin layer where you want a rapid movement of substance across the cell membrane they find it there like the alveolus very thin layer of cells epithelium tissue there all right uh cuboidal cuboidal let's say we take something there um the ovarian tube you can see a lot of cuboidal cells there uh, columnar cells, you see the respiratory system and uh, in the intestines and so on. Okay. And then some of them have like hairline structures on the surface. So we see those hairline structures on the surface, which I believe they like that question too. You see this and then you have hairline structures. Those are known as cilia, right? Cilia. So if you have cilia present, then we call that ciliated epithelium. Ciliated. So this will like ciliated columnar epithelium. The cilia help to move things across the surface of the cell. Okay, cilia. So something like in a respiratory tract, you have ciliated uh, columnar epithelium. You know, so it helps the cilia helps to move the mucus towards the throat so they can cough it out. Okay. So we see these structures. You should know where ciliated, example of ciliated epithelium coming from, like a respiratory um, tract. Okay. That, that, that's 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 that. That. Yes, please. Can you please repeat where you can find the squamous one? Oh, the squamous, something like the, the alveolus, the, the air sac. Example would be like the air sac. Okay, thank you. The alveolus. Yeah. yeah, because we want the air to uh, oxygen and other carbon dioxide to cross it easily, right? So you have to like a thin layer in there or so. Okay. So that's one example, you know, 
if you get to the um, the glomerulus in the in the in the uh, what do you call it the neuron sorry the nephron you also see some over there as well okay, okay great all right so these are all simple right simple ones because one layer okay we have multiple layers let me draw one multiple layer for you to see something that will look like this you have the basement membrane and then you have this on like that the another one so that will be this will be stratified stratified epithelium okay so usually stratified epithelium, you find it where there's a lot of damage, it can wear and tear, you know, like the skin. If you take a skin, for example, it's stratified. There's a lot of friction and so on on the, on the skin. So you want to protect, well, protection, the area. So you have more layers over there. Okay, so that's a typical example, the skin. The surface of the skin, it's an stratified epithelium. Okay. All right, good. So now we talk connective tissue. Uh, for the connective tissue, for now, know some examples. Later, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, the details of like blood and so on. But know some examples of connective tissue. When they ask you which of the following, it's an example of connective tissue, you should be able to state it. So remember, bone is a connective tissue. Blood is a connective tissue. Adipose tissue, that's fat tissue. So adipose, you know, that's also a connective tissue, cartilage, connective tissue. They have the connective tissue proper, connective tissue proper that connects like and in the skin and other tissues, they help to connect um, substance, the other st structures around it. We call the connective tissue proper. And so it's like what we call the ground substance with there. And there are tendons, tendons and ligaments. These are all examples of uh, connective uh, tissues that you should be thinking about when they ask you. Okay, so know the examples for now. We'll talk about the blood in detail um, another time. Okay. Yeah. Then the nervous tissue. You gotta know the nervous tissue. So when it comes to nervous tissue, a typical diagram will look like this. The neuron, right? The neuron is a functional unit. So when I ask what's the functional unit of the nervous system is a neuron, the structure of the nerve, that's a nerve. Okay. So they, sometimes they draw the diagram like this and label one, two, three. And they ask you to identify and or what's the function of the structure label one, the structure label two and three. Okay. So I did that here for you to see. You know. So for one, you know, that is a dendrite the dendrite, right? So the, the neuron branch, which detects the stimulus, detects the stimulus. Then two is known as a cytin or the cell body. Another name is the cell body, the body of the neuron. That's where normal metabolic activities occur, right? And then you have the myelin sheet, that's three, myelin sheet. This, the axon is this one, Let me, I, I, that's five. I'm gonna put five here. That is the axon. Okay, and then I'll put six for this one here. Okay, so the axon is a long one here. Okay, it transmits the impulse. So axon, longest dendrite, which carries nerve message or impulse to the end brushes. So the end brushes here is the terminal dendrite. That's four terminal dendrites. Okay, and then nucleus. In the cell body. So this is a typical cell here. As mitochondrion and other things, all of us, they are all in there. Okay. So now around the axon, you have the myelin sheet. Remember the myelin sheet is a fatty tissue, it's a layer of fat, right? Called a fat fatty sheet that surrounds the axon. Um, what it does is that it provides electrical insulation for the nerve and it also allows for rapid nerve transmission. Right. So any nerve that has myelin around it, we call that a myelinated nerve. Right. We have myelinated nerve. 
myelinated. Be one second, something my pen is okay. It's okay. Uh, myelinated nerve. So I have myelinated, that's I have myelin. If there's no myelin, there's no myelinated. If there's no myelin, okay. Now, if there's myelin, the transmission, the impulse is fast. So the, here, if we need fast impulse transmission, then we use myelinated. So this is fast. Transmission of impulse. If it's non myelinated, here is slow transmission of the impulse. Okay, All right. So this is what happens. We're smiling, the impulse jumps, it like it jumps from this, this point to that point. That you know, we call these notes, the points that you hear, the break between the myelin sheet, we call the nodes of nodes of Ranvier. Somebody's name Ranvier. Okay, there are breaks in the myelin sheet. So the impulse jumps from node to node. So it's like galloping. And gallops, jumps on those. So it's fast. Oh, they're smiling. If there's no myelin, it has to go along the whole entire nerve. You got to travel along the whole nerve, you know, the impulse. Okay. But as I said, it's smiling. It just jumps from node to node. That's why it's fast. Okay. All right. So know the structure of the neuron very well, too. Okay. Now, we also remember that we have the, the um, neuron, they don't directly connect with each other, like there's no contact. It's a space between the neurons and that is known as the synapse or synaptic gap or synapse. Or the synaptic gap, the gap in between synaptic gap. And then this is where you have the neurotransmitters over here. They are released at that point. Okay, so neurotransmitters, they stimulate the adjacent um, neuron. Okay. Chemicals that stimulate the neurons here. Okay. Synaptic gap. Mm -hmm. And then you have to know the muscle tissue to muscle tissues, okay? So the muscle tissues also know the diagram. When they draw the diagram, you will identify them. So as you go, see that we draw a lot of diagrams, you know, that, so that if you see them, you can remember easily. Okay, skeletal, we have skeletal muscle, you have cardiac muscle, and they have smooth muscles, right, a type of muscles. So the skeletal muscles, this is how you can identify them. You see that you have fine, what they call striations. So you see cells that look like they're parallel to each other. And then you have fine patterns like that. If you get a chance, you can Google skeletal muscle to see how it looks like. Fine pattern. And then you see the nucleus will be somewhere there. You know, and so, so we see structure like this, and these are known as the striations. Okay, so another name for skeletal muscle is striated muscle. That's like a striated muscle, five patterns. Right? Okay. 
And the function is to move bony parts of the body, right? They move bony parts. So sometimes they ask a question like this, somebody's climbing the hill, which are the following um, tissue is the person using? Then they have all these options. Then you know that because it's moving bony parts, you know, you have, you have climbing, moving bones, you have to do a skeletal muzzle and so on. Okay. Right. Then for cardiac muzzle on the heart, cardiac muzzle will look like um, something that looks like here. You see branching. The cells will be branching. They'll be interconnected like that. So you see interconnections, and they have nucleus somewhere. Then you are dealing with cardiac muscle. Okay. And then smooth muscle, you find that in the body cavity, such as the stomach, the intestines, the uterus, etc. And as smooth muscles, they look like spindles, like spindle shaped. Spindle shaped structures like that. They have nucleus. So if you see these structures, you should be able to identify what they do and where you find them. Okay. Right. So these are some diagrams that I believe you should know for the test. If you know this, you can answer so many questions, but without so far. Great. Any questions before I, I look at the other side of the lesson? So, so far we've talked about structure of the cell and the functions. We look at type of tissues and uh, movement across the cell membrane okay, so far. Okay. Now let's do a little bit about the chemistry of the cell, chemistry of the cell. So we want to talk about some food substances. And the first one I want to mention is carbohydrates. <clears throat> so you have carbohydrates, you have fat and proteins. So let's begin with carbohydrates. Now there are two main types of carbohydrates, which we have the simple, and then we have the complex, right? Simple, simple sugars are there. There are two types. We have the we have the monosaccharides and they have the disaccharides, right? The monosaccharide. Monosaccharide, one sugar molecule. I have only one sugar molecule. Example, glucose, fructose, and galactose. You got to know these examples. Glucose, fructose, and galactose. Then you have the disaccharides, two molecules made up of, so two molecule sugar. So it's made up a combination of these two, these three molecules. Now the common ones, you have sucrose, you have lactose, and you have maltose. Okay, these are common examples of disaccharides. You have to know what each of these are made up of. Okay, lactose, maltose, sucrose. So I put them here for you to see. Now, uh, how do I remember this? You know, the way I remember this is like this. When I take lactose, now lactose in my mind sounds like galactose. So I know it contains galactose. And then Glucose is always in all of them. So glucose is a second. So I don't want my brain too much about this one. Glucose is all of them. Okay. Now, when I take sucrose, for some funny reason, it rhymes with fructose to me, fructose, sucrose, fructose, sucrose. So I know this has fructose in it.
Fructus. And then the other one is glucose. Then when I come to motors, motors is made up of two glucose molecules. Glucose and another glucose. Okay. Now, very good to know this because when we come to digestion, it's gonna come up again. In this case, you have to think backwards. For example, they, they tell you that somebody eats um, cane sugar, like it's sugar cane, right? Which contains cane sugar. And um, they ask something like, what will be the end product of digestion? The end product of digestion when the person eats cane sugar. Now you have to remember that the cane sugar is sucrose. Sugar cane. The sugar and sugar cane, cane sugar. It's sucrose, right? So if the person eats sucrose, then you break it down to fructose and glucose. Okay. Or what's the end product of digestion of milk? You know that milk is lactose. You find lactose in milk. That's why I have the lactose intolerance. So lactose, in, you have milk contains lactose. So if the person drinks that, then you're gonna end up breaking down into glucose and galactose. Glucose and galactose, right? And so on. And then if the person takes in something that's malt, that have malt, had maltose in it, glucose and glucose, okay? the end product of digestion. So again, I'll stress that, no, the breakdown, okay, like this. Okay. They have the complex sugars. The complex sugars are those that we call the polysaccharides, the polysaccharides, the complex sugars. They are made up of many molecules of um, the monosaccharides. We call them polysaccharides. Okay. Example will be starch, cellulose, glycogen. These are all examples of um, complex sugars. Many glucose molecules joined um, together. Okay. And the bond between the, uh, what do you call it? The sugars, we call that a glycosidic bond. Okay, glycosidic bond. You know, if you're doing chemistry, it will come up glycosidic bond. Okay. Um, but don't worry yourself too much for that now, but we can just put it somewhere. If a sugar, molecule here, sugar, another sugar. We call glycosidic bond. I say sugar. Okay, all right. So that's how the peptide bond, the, sorry, the polysaccharide is formed. Now, I would like to stress on these differences here. Again, plants and animals. So that's I put hints to some questions here. Now, glycogen is a story form of carbohydrate in only animals. All right, so remember all the animals have glycogen. Plants don't have glycogen, they don't. So these are very good exceptions that can come on the test. Anything that has glycogen should be related to animal. Now plants have cellulose in them. Animals don't have cellulose. So that's another key point, right? Another key point, animals, we don't have starch in us. 
starch can only be found in plants. Okay, so starch in plants. So these are some key things that you should note down. Okay, cellulose starch plants, glycogen animals. Okay. So let me add the starch here. Only and plants. Okay. All right. So now this is an in, a typical question. I think again we may find it in the book when we when we go through the book. Okay. So what I do, as I said, we'll have a discussion. We'll go to the book and then we'll answer some questions to see if we can relate it, you know, to what we studied today. Um, at the end of the lesson, like the last day, we'll take like a practice exam, practice, practice test, which you grade yourself. Um, and then we'll discuss whatever we did in, what, whatever you did on that test. We'll end up, we'll discuss that, you know, like a last review on the last day. Okay. okay. But in between, I will give you some, you know, practice questions to do on your own as well. You know, I'll put it on Google Classroom and I can practice and it, and it will great for you automatically. All right, great. So this is the end of the carbohydrates. Now, yeah, I think there's one more, I'll add that at the end. How to test for each of these carbohydrates. Okay, all right, for proteins, proteins, I want you to know that they are made up of amino acids, right? Amino acids, you remember that. And the bond between the amino acids is known as a peptide bond, peptide bond. Okay, so proteins, amino acid joined together. Basic unit of protein, amino acid, joined by peptide bond, okay. Then lipids, lipids are the fat and oil. And they're made up of lipid made up of fatty acids and glycerol, fatty acids and glycerol. Okay. So if we take the fatty acid, this is how fatty acid looks like. You have a lipid made up of Sometimes you have difficulty to the pen responding. Lipid, we said it's fatty acids. Glycerol. Now, the fatty acids look like this. Usually in organic chemistry, if you've done organic chemistry, you will know how fatty acids look like. But if you've if not done that, don't worry. I'll just draw something for you to see. It's anything that has COOH at the end is a fatty acid. So I'll, I'll take this out here. I'll put what we call R. R rep represents any carbon chain, like it's carbon turn to carbon and so on. Right, that's what if you use R in organic chemistry, that's what that means. We'll talk a little bit about organic chemistry classification another day. But they have OO at the end, what's called a carboxylic group. This is called a carboxylic group. Functional group. So anything with CO at the end like that is an it's a fatty acid. And then glycerol looks like this. You have three carbons and they have OH, OH, OH here, and they have hydrogen all around it. That is glycerol, okay. So what happens is that the fatty acid here, this will replace the hydrogen here. Okay, if you have only one hydrogen replaced here, then you have what we call a monosaccharide. If you have another fatty acid replacing this hydrogen here, it becomes a, di a, tri a disaccharide. 
if all the hydrogens, the three hydrogens here are re replaced by the fatty acid, then you have trisaccharides and so on. Okay. So, but remember that lipid is made up of fatty acid and glycerol. Okay. Okay. And then how do you test for the food substances? Important to know that. Now for starch, we test for, the, for starch. We do, you can do the iodine test, iodine test. When you add iodine to um, starch, it turns blue-black, the color becomes blue-black, have a blue-black color. If you see that, then you know you're dealing with, with, with starch. Um, another name that you come across when you for test for starch, you come across the word Lugol. Lugol solution. If you come across Lugol solution, this is basically iodine in alcohol. Okay, iodine in alcohol, that's what this is, iodine in alcohol. We call that iodine tincture, iodine tincture. Lugo solution, that's what is used to test for starch, you know. So it's under the iodine or you see the word Lugo solution. They like to use that Lugo, somebody's name would test. Then simple sugar, how do you test for simple sugar? You can do what we call the Benedict's test, or you can do the Fehling's test. You add the reagent called Fehling's reagent or Benedict's reagent to the substance, and then you boil it. Once you boil it, it becomes, you say, it turns from purple to the brick red color. If you see that purple changing into a brick red, coloration, then you are dealing with a simple sugar, simple sugar, okay? So that's how you test for it. And then for proteins, test for proteins, you do what we call the Barrett's test, Barrett's test. The Barrett test, you have a light blue color that changes to purple. So you add, a sub, add the Barrett to the protein, initially it's light blue. It turns purple, then you know you're dealing with um, protein. And then lipid, Lipid, you can do a quick test, like, you know, lipid can stain paper, even if it's dry, it still stains it. So it can be a quick test to, for lipid. But a proper test that is done is called a Sudan, Sudan, Sudan black. Okay, if you add it, you have that black color. You know, the lipid Sudan, I think three or something. get a black, black color, they are dealing with a lipid. Okay. So these are the tests for the various substances that we've spoken about. Okay. Any questions on these things so far? I think we are making progress slowly. Okay. Right. Okay. Now, there's one more group of substance I will talk about before we talk about the structure of the atom. Um, I would like to talk about the DNA. So let's go back here. Let's talk about the RNA and DNA. The differences, right? So remember RNA is made up of phosphates. You have phosphates in it, phosphates. Phosphates. RNA also has the same thing. So DNA has phosphate, RNA also has phosphates. Okay. Two, remember that DNA is double helix.
RNA is single. Three, DNA has D or C, rebel sugar. So you have a sugar. That's where the name comes from, deoxyribose sugar. Whilst the RNAR has a ribose sugar, right? Then you have what we call the nitrogen bases. They all have nitrogen bases in them. This also has nitrogen bases, but there are some differences. What are the nitrogen bases here? One, you have guanine. We're gonna use G for guanine. You have cytosine. Let's use C. Then you have what we call thymine. So that'll be T. And then you have adenine. That is A. So these are the, <coughs> the um, nitrogen bases in the DNA. One way you can remember, I use like GCAT. G cat, like a mnemonic to help you, G cat. Guanine, cytosine, adenine, and thymine, G cat, like M cat, G cat. Okay. And then when it comes to the RNA, RNA has the guanine, it's still there, G. We still have cytosine. And then we have adenine. Now, timing is replaced by uracil. So we can have uracil here. Uracil. So U. So uracil replaces the timing. Okay. So that's a difference, uracil. Now also know that guanine always attaches to cytosine by three hydrogen bonds, right? The bond between the two, like they call hydrogen bond. And then adenine combines, always attaches to thymine. We call them complementary base pairs. They complement each other. So this is adding in two hydrogen bonds in between, that's in timing. Okay. When you come here, you have guanine with cytosine and adding in will now go with uracil, double hydrogen bonds like that. Okay. So remember this for questions as well. I uh, will talk about protein synthesis uh, probably another time. Um, but basically, protein synthesis starts with the DNA, right? It starts with the DNA. A quick overview will be like this. So we start with the DNA. And then DNA will be copied to RNA. DNA to RNA. RNA here. And we call that the messenger RNA. Messenger RNA. Uh, 
Sorry, my pen is responding slowly. Okay. Messenger RNA, okay. So for DNA to R messenger RNA, we call that transcription. Transcription. To transcribe. Okay. And then from the RNA to the protein, we call that translation. The post called translation. So remember you transcribe and then you translate what you have, right? Message. <laughs> the DNA, remember that the genes or the the genes are formed by the uh, nitrogen basis. The nitrogen basis form the, the genes. So for example, I can have genes like, let's say they give you G, A, T, T, um, C, A, G, T, A, a, something like this. If these are the genes on the <coughs> um, on the DNA, what do you call it, the chromosome or the DNA, you can be asked to transcribe this <coughs> into the messenger RNA. Okay, the M is messenger. Yeah, messenger. Messen messenger RNA. That's what the M means mRNA. <clears throat> so if we transcribe this, it means that you have to come up with a complement, right? You count the complement of this. So the complement of this in the RNA gene, gene will have to complement with C. So it will be C. They can give you something like this and ask you to transcribe it. Then A, A usually goes with um, the T in R DNA. But this time we are working with RNA. <laughs> So you don't have T in RNA, you have U, U. So A will go with U here. So you have U. You're gonna have U. Uh, U here. And then T will go with A. This T will go with A. <coughs> Excuse me. And then this C will go with G. A will go with U, G will go with C, T will complement, complemented by A, and A will be U, and this A will be U. So this will be the code on the messenger RNA. <clears throat> All right, so you should be able to translate whatever is given to you. If they give DNA to RNA, you should to write this. If it's DNA to DNA, then there will be no U, it will rather be T in there okay, in place of the U. So, okay. so each three of the codes of the, of the genes <laughs> represent what we call the codon. So every three is what we call the codon. So these are codons. Okay, <clears throat> the codon forms the gene, <laughs> the gene. Okay, that is the code. Okay, so what happens here is that now you're going to have the other RNA coming in called the rRNA. So rRNA is going to do the reading. Okay, so rRNA will come and read. It usually has like pockets in it, like that, and has two subunits. So this is your R RNA. R RNA means ribosomal R RNA. R ribosomal. Ribosomal 
RNA. That is the rRNA. That's what that means. So the rRNA does the reading, reads a code. Reads code. Okay, it reads the code. So it's going to read a three, and then once it reads a three, it's going to bring, it's going to call for a particular the amino acid that is represented by this code, right? Each one represents a particular amino acid. So it will call for the amino acid to be brought in. And that amino acid is brought in by another RNA called a tRNA. tRNA is called transfer RNA. So the transfer RNA will bring the amino acid that corresponds to um, this particular codon, right? Three at a time. So transfer RNA looks like this, it has what we call a clover leaf shape, like a clover leaf. And then the RNA, the, Amino acid will attach to it. This amino acid will be attached to it. Now, over here will be the complement of whatever this is, right? So, this C, so this is G. This will be um, A, and this is your U. Okay. So, this is your transfer, T R N A. So tRNA is transfer RNA. Transfer. tRNA. Transfer. I'm having a slow response again. Okay, let me talk whilst it responds, right? Okay, so T means, um, the tRNA means transfer RNA. So it brings the um, amino acid. It brings the amino acid here. Uh, sorry. Give me a second, let me see what's happening to the pen. Okay, it's right in now. Okay, so it brings a transfer RNA here. T means transfer. Transfer RNA. So it brings amino acid, so it carries amino acid. Okay, that's a function. So bring the amino acid here. Then the rRNA will move and then go and read the other three. Is it going to read the other three? You know, and then it will bring another transfer RNA and so on, right? Another transfer RNA will come in. And then eventually they form a bond. So that's how the protein is formed. So remember the functions of the different RNAs, tRNA, rRNA, and mRNA. mRNA has a message. rRNA reads the code. And then tRNA transfers or brings in amino acid. 
So that's what I want you to know for this one. Right? So this is just a quick overview of what photosynthesis is all about, you know. Okay. So let's keep it simple like this for now. Okay. All right, so any questions so far on what we have done? Okay. Before we talk a little bit about the concept of the atom. All right, so I believe so far everybody's fine. So these are like review of things that you already um, know. Okay. All right, good. All right, so let's go over the structured atom quickly. All right. So remember the atom is a basic unit of an element, right? Basic unit of an element. Then every atom has what we call atomic number. Remember that the atomic number is the same as the number of protons. These concepts are very important. Atomic number is the same as the number of protons. Now the protons and neutrons are in the nucleus of the atom. Remember that part too. And sometimes we give them names, the, we call them the, the proton and the neutrons. Together we call them the new kions. Nucleons. The so nucleus are like particles within the um, nucleus. Okay. Now the protons are positively charged. Electrons are negatively charged. And the electrons are located in the orbits or the or, or, of the shells. Okay. So if I take the atom, it looks like I have the nucleus and they have the orbit. The orbit is like the path in which you find electrons. Electrons will be circulating around the nucleus in the orbit. So this will be like electron. Orbit. Several orbits will form like a shell. You have so many orbits together. Okay. Um, and then the neutrons are neutral. They have no charge on them. Okay. Now, here we have, now the number of electrons is the same as the number of protons in the neutral atom. So I'm gonna highlight that. They are the same, sorry, yeah, the same. The number of electrons is the same as the number of protons in the neutral um, atom. Then you have the atomic mass. Every atom has a mass. So the atomic mass is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. Number of protons by the number of neutrons. Again, this is also very important concept. This and that. And how do we write these out? So the atom, every element has a symbol. So let's take something like oxygen. Oxygen is, is zero, right? O, O is oxygen, O. Oxygen, O. And then the, you have these numbers here. This subscript is the atomic number and the superscript is the atomic mass. So they write it like this, this atomic mass here. And then this atomic number. That's a mass. And then the superscript is the atomic number. If they write it like this, okay. Now in the periodic table, it's the other way around, right? The periodic table, you see that they write atomic um, number below the symbol of the element, and then they write the mass, the, the, the atomic number is uh, rather above, and then you have the atomic mass below, right? Okay. If you look at the periodic table. Okay. But if they write like this, this is what it means, okay. Now the electrons in the outermost shell are referred to as the valence electrons. So when I say valence electrons, we're talking about the electrons in the outermost shell. I'm gonna explain that again. 
okay? And they are involved in chemical reactions, right? Uh, atoms with the same number of valence electron belong to the same group. So we take group one on the periodic table, you all have the same number of electrons on the outside. Group two on the periodic table, same number of electrons on the outside and so on, okay? Then the other fact we want to point out is that when an atom loses an electron, it becomes positively charged, like aluminum, Al. If it loses electrons, it becomes positively charged. So here means, in this case, it has lost three electrons. So it's positive charge, okay? We'll explain that a little bit more. And then when an atom gains an electron, it becomes negatively charged. Example, oxygen, if it gains two electrons, it becomes two minus, which is written like this, okay? Gain two electrons. So positive electron loss, negative electron gain, right? Now, the charges, when you see a charge on them like this, we call this ions. Ion. So these are ions, I-O-N. So this is an ion. So positive ion. If we, we call this, we have an ion, that's if it's negative. Charge on it. And then we refer to it as cation. If it has a positive charge on it. Okay, so like aluminum here will be a cation, whereas the oxygen here will be an anion, okay, negative on it. Okay, ions. Okay. Right, so let's break this down into a typical um, question form. Okay, let's look at the table. Now we, got, we call this the electronic configuration. How are the electrons um, distributed in the orbits? Okay, so let's begin with sodium. So sodium 23 and 11, atomic number of 11. So we have 23 and 11 and A, that's sodium. Okay. So they can ask you how many protons, how many neutrons, how many electrons. Okay, you should be able to do that exercise. Okay, that's why I have the table here. So for sodium, Let's break this down into three columns here. Protons, electrons, and neutrons. Okay. So how many protons do we have here? As I said, the protons is the same as the number of, um, the same as atomic number, right? Same atomic number. So here the atomic number is 11. So we have a electron of 11. So the number of protons will be 11. Okay. How many electrons? We said that the number of electrons is the same as atomic number or the number of protons. If there's no charge on that element. So since there's no charge on this element, the electrons will also be 11. What's the number of neutrons? Number of neutrons. If you add the protons to electrons, sorry, if you add the protons to neutrons, it gives you the atomic mass. Okay, the mass here, 23, is made up of the protons and the neutrons. Protons plus neutrons is atomic mass. So to find the number of neutrons, you have to subtract. So it's 23 minus 11. This is 23, 11, 23 minus 11, so that gives us 12. So we're gonna have 12. Neutrons like that. This is 12. Okay. So the key of question is sure to break it down like this. Okay. Now let's put a charge on the sodium. So Na, I'm gonna put a charge plus one plus like this. Atomic number is 23, so, sorry, 11, and the mass is 20, 
23. Still, it, those don't change. Those things don't change. So how many protons we have here? Number of protons will be 11. There's atomic number. So this is 11. Okay, let's see. Eleven here. Number of electrons. Now the number of electrons we expect it to be eleven if there's no charge, right? If it's neutral, then it should be same as protons. But when I look here, it's plus one or one plus. It means that's lost one electron because that's lost one electron. It means that the number of electrons is no more eleven. It has to go down by one. So this becomes ten. So I have ten electrons. How many neutrons? The neutrons is the difference between the atomic number and the mass. So 23 minus 11, and then that still means 12. Okay, so that's how you play around with this information. Okay. Okay, let's do another one. Let's look at oxygen 16 and then 8 and then we'll look at oxygen 16 8 but then 2 minus how many protons here will somebody want to try this one eight eight correct so eight that's atomic number eight number of electrons eight Eight, correct. And then neutrons? Eight. Eight, perfect. Because 16 minus eight. Okay, that's correct. All right, so let's go to the, the one with the charge. How many protons? Eight. Eight, correct. Electrons? Six. Six. Okay, what does this one mean? Because, oh, never mind. Yeah, two minus. So it gained, right? Gained two electrons. Negative oh, extra, so it's with 10, right? And then the neutrons will be still eight. Okay, All right. So that's how you play around when they give you this type of information. You know, they'll always tell you the mass and atomic number, one way or the other. You know, they always tell you either they give you a low periodic table or they'll give you the information right there. Okay. All right, great. So that's how you wrong with this okay now the other thing is how are the electrons arranged around the atom right so i'll do that for sodium sorry for yeah for sodium for you to see so let's take sodium and if i take sodium again in 23 and 11 we're going to arrange the electrons that's what called the electronic configuration the arrangement um so we start with you always start with the inner orbit. If it's a nucleus inside, right? The orbit first shell will be the orbit, right? Always the inner shell takes maximum of two or the orbits. Two electrons will go into the inner shell, the one close to the nucleus. So two electrons. Once it's two, it, the shell is happy. One maximum of two, happy. So once you put two in there, now you're gonna Put the other electrons in the next orbit. The next orbit. Okay. So we, we are dealing with 11. We are distributing 11 electrons, right? So two here. So now we're going to have one, two, three, four, five. Five, six, seven, and eight. The maximum electrons I can put in, in the second shell is eight, right? So eight maximum. Once you get to eight, spill it over to the next shell, you know? So always you get to eight, fill, fill up the nest. 
only the inner one takes two. So here we have one more left. So one electron left. Okay, so we distributed 11 electrons in the orbit. So that's the configuration. Okay, this is how it's gonna look like. But on the test, you know, we have all the time to draw all these things, right? So there's an, a little bit faster way to write this if you're drawing. And that's what I'm gonna use most of the time, okay? So the inner shell it takes two, so we're gonna write two. Then use the, um, the column. Then the next shell we're writing down here, so eight, we'll go to the next shell. Once you get to eight, spill over to the next shell, so column again, and then this will represent the next shell. You have one on the outside, okay. like this. So two, eight, one. You see two, eight, one, then this is sodium. Okay, two, eight, one. The outer shell is what we call the valence shell. So when they ask what's the valency of sodium, the valency of sodium is going to be one. So the number of electrons on the outermost shell. So valency of one. It's one, okay. How many electrons do you have on the outermost shell? Valency of one. It has two here, there to be two, and so on, three. So valency of one. Number of electrons in the outermost shell, okay. Now, so what's going to happen to sodium when it loses an electron, right? So that's what takes us to what we call the bonding. Let's talk about chemical bonds chemical bonds. There are um, about four main types, but we'll talk about three, um, I think three of them, two, two of them today, two or three. Okay. Now the first one will be the ionic bond. We want to talk about ionic bond, all right? So let's look at ionic bond here. Now ionic bond is formed when an atom loses electrons and the other accepts them. One loses, the other one accepts. Okay, then you have what we call the um, ionic bond, you form ions. Okay, so let's look at sodium, example like sodium chloride. Now, sodium, if you, the structure, electronic configuration is 281. We just seen that here. And chlorine, the atomic number is 17. Atomic number is 17. So chlorine is 287, as you can see here, 287. Okay, so what's going to happen? Sodium will lose its valence electrons. Has, if it loses one electron here, then it has eight on the outside. Anything that has eight on the outside is stable. Like we call it the noble gases, the, like group eight or the periodic table. They are all stable. Okay, so all the elements want to become like them, as you know from your chemistry classes. So once this loses electron, atomous electron, it gives you the chlorine. And then chlorine now becomes what? Eight on the outside, because it has seven. So it has valency of seven, now becomes eight on the outside. So they are both happy. So it has eight on the outside, chlorine has eight on the outside here. So both of them are happy. You know, so we have sodium plus and chlorine plus. So chlorine minus, chlorine minus. So together you form the sodium chloride like this. Okay, and that's an ionic bond. The one loses, the other one gains the electrons and then they form a bond, ionic bond. Okay, so that's how that is formed. Okay. Yeah. All right. Then we come to covalent bond. Now covalent bond, that one involves sharing, sharing of the um, electrons. Here they don't transfer. So the key word is sharing, they share electrons. Okay, and then they form a bond. So one way to identify covalent bond is formed between non-metals. Non-metals form um, covalent bond, right? Like hydrogen, hydrogen, chlorine, chlorine, hydrogen, chlorine, non-metals. Well, so if you can get here, sodium is, a, is, is a metal and then chlorine is a non-metal. So now they form um, ionic bonds, right? So far right on the periodic table, far left on the periodic table. When they come together, they form ionic bonds. Okay. So covalent sharing, sharing, and this is how it occurs. Chlorine, if you look here, chlorine has seven on the outside. 
let's begin with the hydrogen one first. Hydrogen has one and this one has one. So two of them can come together and it will share the electrons. It's like this one, the other one has one. Then they, they come together, they bring and they share. So when they share electrons, it belongs to each of them. So this one has two and this one has two, hydrogen, hydrogen, and they have H2, that's how it's formed. Okay. okay, so this line is a bond, the two electrons here, that's what I'm, the line means two electrons. Okay, chlorine seven, so as they share, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So the only way they can be stable is to, sh is to share. So this chlorine, this brings its electron, this one brings another electron. Then together, they share the electron, they form one, two together. Then these ones will all be one, two, three, four, have eight for this. Then these two belongs to this one as well. So it still has, um, so eight, Eight, both of them are happy, they're stable. So you have the, so you have the, this over there, you know. The same with hydrogen chloride, sharing, okay. So anytime there's two, no, two non-metals, you form like a, a covalent bond, okay. Now the key point here is that even though they are sharing, sometimes some um, atoms tend to steal from the other. Okay, they, they, it's like they pull more electrons from the other ones, even though they are sharing. So you can have an unequal sharing, right? When that occurs, they have what we call a polar covalent bond, polar covalent, right? And that's unequal sharing. So this is what we have. See, when you take something like water, an example like water, let's use the water example here. Okay, it's a covalent bond, right? Even though it's a covalent bond here, covalent. Now, hydrogen, oxygen tends to pull more from the hydrogen. So at every point in time, you're gonna have more electrons on the hydrogen. It's gonna pull so you have more electrons on the hydro oxygen than on the hydrogen, right? So we see the sign delta symbol, delta negative. This in chemistry means a, a little bit more, like slight. It said it's delta positive on hydrogen. So it means slightly positive. It means that's lost electrons. And then this will lose a slightly positive because it's losing to the uh, oxygen. Okay, so when that occurs, you have what you call the polar covalent bond. It becomes polar, you know, and because it's anything that is polar would dissolve in a polar substance, right? Solvent. If there's so this is on this is unequal sharing, unequal sharing, then you have a polar covalent bond. If it's equal sharing, then it's non-polar. Equal sharing. They have a non-polar covalent bond. Okay, for example, if I have hydrogen, H2, it's hydrogen and hydrogen. They don't, no, nobody steals from each other. They equal pool. So this is a non-polar mm -hmm. substance and so on. Okay, all right. And that is what this is talking about here. Okay. Um, there's a rule which sometimes we call something electronegativity difference. Um, the elements are given numbers, like electronegativity um, numbers. Okay, if the difference between the two elements, the numbers between the two elements is less than 1.2, then we assume that the bond between the atoms is covalent. If the difference is greater than 1.8, then the bond is assumed to be ionic, you know, when you're using those numbers, you know. 
compound for which the electronegativity difference is between 1.2 and 1.8 are best described as polar or polar covalent, like in between. So those are the cutoff when they using what they call electronegativity numbers. You subtract them, if the numbers are, they fall into these ones, they can classify them. So that leads to what we call hydrogen bond. Hydrogen bond. Um, so when hydrogen atoms are joined in a polar covalent bond with a small atom of high electronegativity, such as oxygen, fluorine, nitrogen, the partial positive charge on the hydrogen is highly concentrated because of its small size. If the hydrogen is close to another atom, another oxygen, fluorine, or nitrogen in another molecule, then there's a force of attraction termed the dipole-dipole interaction. This attraction is known as the hydrogen bond. So hydrogen bond is a special type of bond, right? So hydrogen bond has a very important effect on the properties of water and ice. Hydrogen bond is also very important in protein and nucleic acids, and therefore in life processes, okay? So what we're saying is that if you take something like the water, the water, as you can see here, spatial charges on negative charge on oxygen, partial charge on the hydrogen, right? This is the water here. I'll draw it again. So we have oxygen, hydrogen, hydrogen. Slightly negative, slightly positive here because of the pool on it, stealing from the hydrogen. So another molecule of water will also have the same thing. It's also polarized, so it becomes like this. Let's hold up for a second again, slow response again. Okay, so hydrogen, slightly negative here, slightly positive, a little bit positive, partial positive here. Okay, so that's another molecule. So what happens? Opposite uh, forces attract, opposite charges attract. So here, then positive on hydrogen, will interact with the negative on the oxygen. And then they form, so this is what's called a hydrogen bond here. It forms a hydrogen bond. Okay. So it's like intermolecular bond between the molecules, intermolecular. Okay. And that's what holds the water molecules together. So this one water molecule, another one with the interaction. Then it's gonna run throughout the whole water molecule. Another one will do the same thing positive interact with negative and so on. Okay. And that's what holds the molecules together. So this is a special type of bond and it's only formed when you have oxygen, fluorine and nitrogen, these ones. Okay. It should be present before you can form hydrogen bond. So hydrogen, you should have nitrogen, oxygen and fluorine before you can have hydrogen bond in there, which is special type of bond. Yeah. Right. So yeah. this should be enough of uh what do you call it of the bonding for today. Okay. Any questions on the atom atomic structure that we discussed. Any questions? All right. So, so far, so good. Okay. So, what we're going to do, we're going to, I'm going to go over the last piece here and then we'll look at questions. Okay. So, we'll look at this quickly here. 
and then it will be good for the science today. All right, so another thing that I have to know very well is the eye. And the eye, almost every time they, those questions, the eye comes in, it comes up. So know the eye inside out. Okay. Again, they label it one, two, three, and should identify the parts. Okay. So if you take the eye, remember you have the lens, the blue part, the lens here. So the lens for focusing, right? With the eye, the lens for focusing of the image. Another word that you come up with is accommodation, accommodating, accommodation. Um, know about the, um, the chamber in front of the lens, known as the aqueous humor, the anterior chamber. There's anterior chamber here. It, it contains what they call the aqueous humor, right, right here. So it's a fluid in front of the eye. It helps to bend light onto the retina. Then at the back of the lens is the posterior chamber. It contains what we call the vitreous humor right here. So that one is jelly, like jelly. It helps to keep the shape of the eyeball. It also helps to bend light. Okay. Then the pupil, the space between this brown thing here, there's iris, right? The colored part iris. Okay. And the space between that is a pupil. The pupil, that's a hole in the middle of the iris through which light enters the eye, the pupil. So the pupil is controlled by the iris. As I said, a colored sheet of muscle, it's a muscle. And that controls the size of the pupil, right? The size of the pupil, you know, the, the iris. Um, and then the coverings, the cornea in front, covering the cornea, conjunctiva. You go to the back, you have the sclera, outer coat, you know, and then inside you have the chorion and other things here. But the part that I want you to focus on is the retina, the retina. Okay, the retina, two things in the retina that um, they like a lot, the rods and the cones, the rods and cones. So if you read the rods and cones, very important. Remember that I'll tell the function shortly. Um, and then you have the optic nerve right here that goes to the brain, okay. So this is like a table summarizes the functions the function I should know, okay. So I'll highlight this retina here as one important thing you should know, the rods and cones, the rods and cones. Okay, so key points, it's this. So the lens for focusing objects on the retina, iris, controls the amount of light entering the eye by changing the size of pupil. The pupil, the aperture of bounded by the iris, the retina, the back of the eye where the image is formed, contains the light sensitive structures, the rods and cones. Function on the cones and the rods, don't forget that. The rods is needed for night vision. It helps you to see well in the night since they are very sensitive to light. Then it also helps to distinguish black and white colors, black and white colors, okay? Then the cones, they are needed for daytime vision and for distinguishing between colors. So the cones help to distinguish between colors, okay? Then the optic nerve, the optic nerve transmits the image to the retina, okay? So this is a, that's key points that I want you to know for this particular one, okay, the rods and the cones, and the lens for focusing or accommodation. I'm gonna write that here, accommodation, another way for focusing to accommodate the image on the retina. Accommodation. Okay. All right. So if you know these things on the eye, it should be very, very fine. It's a little, little things that you have to know in the test. Okay. 
And then when we come to the ear, stretch of the ear, it's a little bit complex. So usually you don't have a diagram like that, but you should know certain parts of a functions. So the ear has the outer, you have the outer ear, three parts, outer, and then you have the middle ears right here, middle here, and then you have the inner ear, inner ears, where the purple part is the inner ear, the red part is the middle ear, and then the outer ear is a greenish portion. Okay, so ear lobe is also in the, the pinna, and then you have the external auditory canal right there, that's a the green one, green part, and then tympanic membrane, that's a green. Okay, so the sound goes through here and then it impinges on the tympanic membrane. So the tympanic membrane vibrates. Once it vibrates, it sends the vibration to the middle ear. In the middle ear, you have three bony structures, three bony structures. We call the malus, incus, and stips. Those are the three bony structures I see here. The malus, incus, and stips. Together, we call them the ossicles. Okay, we call them the ossicles. Okay. See, they vibrate and send the, uh, the vibration to the middle, the inner ear. The inner ear, like a those snail like structure. Inner ear, it's got a, the snail part is called the cochlea, like a cochlea. And they have a part called the vestibule, mm -hmm. vestibule somewhere around here, but the snail part is called the cochlea. Mm -hmm. Now, the cochlea is for hearing. Cochlea for hearing. Now, the vestibular part is for balancing, right? Mm -hmm. It's for balancing. Cochlear for hearing, vestibule, or is for balancing. Then you have these semicircular structures here, that, like a tube, three of them called the semicircular canals. This one here. They are right angles to each other, right? And the function is for balancing. They also help in balancing. So no matter, it's like a, a three dimension, X, Y, and Z. X, Y, Z planes. So no matter where you turn your head, you are covered in all the planes. It helps, it helps to balance. Yeah. So if I tilt my head one side or my body goes one side, the other, uh, one of them will respond and then it will help me to balance and so on. So any direction is covered, X, Y, and Z directions are all covered. Okay, so that, and then you have the eustachian tube. The eustachian tube right there, it connects the middle ear to the, to the throat, eustachian tube. And the function of the eustachian tube is to help to balance the pressure within the ear, right? So that's why when you're in a flight, you go up, and then the pressure changes. So it collapses the eustachian tube. They have that funny feeling in the, in the ear. But when you swallow something, then it opens up. It opens up to balance the air pressure. You know, so this, that's what happened. That's the function of the station to to balance the pressure in the middle ear. Okay, all right. So again, this is a summary over here for you to remember all that I've said. Okay, outer ear, the ear lobe pinna to the tympanic membrane. The passage direct sound to the middle ear. Tympanic membrane. See the sound symbols. Middle ear. This contains a bony structures called sickles. <clears throat> Three of them, bellows, incus, and stapes. They conduct the sound vibration to the inner ear. Inner ear, this houses the cochlea and the semicircular canals. Cochlea, snail like structure, which is required for hearing. Semicircular canals, three tubes, tube like structures, arranged at right angles to each other. They are needed for balancing on the body. And they have the, the nerve, the vestibular cochlear nerve. So the cochlear branch of the vestibular cochlear nerve is the sensory nerve that transmits the sound impulse to the brain. Then the vestibular branch of the vestibular cochlear nerve is sensory nerve that involves with balancing, right? So the vestibular balancing cochlear hearing, that's what you can take from this, okay? All right, so I put some questions here uh, to think about. What will happen if the cochlear is damaged? A question like this, then you know, it's for balance, it's for hearing, so the person with difficulty to hear. What will happen if the semicircular canals are damaged? You know that they're for balancing. So if there's a problem with that, the person has difficulty balancing. What will happen if the vesicular nerve is damaged or affected? 
so the nerve going to the brain is damaged. So the, the person will not hear or have difficulty balancing as well. Okay. So that is um, the overview of what the ear structure looks like and the functions. Okay. <laughs> and then finally for today, a quick look at the brain, overview of the brain. Okay. So this is a quick diagram, a diagram of the brain. Uh, remember you have what the cerebrum, or oh, this the cerebrum is a big part, or oh, this big part, cerebrum. Then you have the cerebellum here, cerebellum. And then you have the brain, the brain stem. All oh, this year, brain stem. Okay, parts of the brain. And then the cerebrum has different parts, as you can see here. If you do anatomy physiology, then you go more into details for this. Okay, so temporal lobe, occipital lobe, frontal lobe, frontal, temporal, occipital at the back, parietal lobe, you know. Okay. And then I have the functions, the functions, summary of the functions right here. You know, the frontal lobe mainly for, you know, like your thought processes, thinking, your intelligence and all those things, reasoning, you know, all care around here, emotions, behaviors, thinking, you know, parietal lobe, Helps you to know your right from the left side of the body, feeling sensations, uh, reading and speech like area, you know, understanding spatial orientation, okay. all around the parietal lobe. Occipital lobe for vision, color blindness and so on. The person has a problem there. So vision, temporal lobe, temporal lobe for hearing, mostly hearing. You know, also you have memory and then behavior and understanding language because you need to hear to understand in certain things. So all temporal lobe. Okay. And then the brainstem, the brainstem is very important. The brainstem, that's where you have uh, the medulla oblongata, medulla oblongata, right? The if medulla oblongata controls the breathing and respiration. So the rate of breathing and um, your heart rate, the heart rate as well. Okay, so here you have brain stem, breathing, blood pressure, heartbeat, swallowing, you know, all here. Temperature, digestion, so on, body temperature. Okay, but the key important thing is medulla oblongata. It's a cardio respiratory center. Cardio. respiratory center. Okay. So it controls respiration and the heart rate. Okay. So if somebody has something like a whiplash injury, right, in an accident, the medulla oblongata is closely related to the cervical bone, the neck bone. You know, so if it fractures, it can compress on it. If the, let's say a person is lifted up, you don't lift the person up well, you have to put a collar around the neck before you lift the person. Or if you bend the neck, you may damage the medulla oblongata. You know, the person will stop breathing and um, the heart rate will, the heart will stop okay, because the person was not lifted up. Well, that's why they put a collar on the neck to stabilize the neck before you move it. So you don't damage the medulla oblongata because the neck bones right somewhere here. You know. And then we come to the cerebellum. The cerebellum keyword is for balancing for balancing and coordination. That's the function of the cerebellum, balancing and coordination. If you are walking, it helps you to balance yourself. You, know. you can close your eyes and walk all because of the cerebellum. You know. So those are the quick overview of the parts of the brain and what they do. Okay, but if you forget everything at all, Mandela Blongata, don't forget that. Okay, don't forget that one. Okay. And then finally, for today, we'll look at the reflex arc. 
this is a reflex arc, right? So the reflex arc begins with, if I step on a, a sharp object, I don't have to think, I have to act before I think. Okay, so that's the reflex action. So let's begin with the skin. Something pricks the skin, like a, a sharp pin or needle. Then the impulse goes through the first neuron or nerve known as the sensory neuron, it's called the efferent. So you have the efferent neuron right here, okay? So the efferent neuron, another name for it is a sensory. Neuron, so it goes through this sensory or the efferent neuron and then go to the spinal cord. So this is a spinal cord. Everything occurs at the level of spinal cord. Okay. So it travels in the, into the spinal cord and the spinal cord, we have what we call the interneuron. The interneuron interprets the message and then generates a response. And the response go through the efferent neuron. So another name for efferent neuron, you could count as the modal, modal neuron. Okay, another name for it. So the efferent neuron, modal neuron. And then that initiates an action. It goes to a muscle and then you can lift up your leg. Okay, so it's a quick response that occurs at the level of the spinal cord, okay. So once the response is generated, then some of the message was sent. We call you have something called ascending fibers. Then if it will travel along the ascending fibers into the um, brain, you know, to make you aware of what is happening. But before then, <laughs> you're not aware of this. Everything's at the level of spinal cord, quick action before you even think about what happened. You know, so that is the reflex act. So remember, it starts with the sensory, this you have the sensory neuron over there to the interneuron, then from interneuron to the motor neuron or efferent to interneuron and efferent neuron. Okay, all right. So this is where we're gonna stop for today on the, uh, what do you call it? For the science, for the science part. Um, there's one more piece that I'd like to talk about that acids and bases. Um, but I think I'm gonna pause here for, for today on, on the science. Okay. I'll push acid and bases to next, the next session. We have, we have a longer session next week, so I can push it to that day. Okay, any questions on um, what we've done so far? Questions? Are we able to see the recording? Like you're gonna see? Recording. Yes, I'm gonna, I'm gonna post the recording um, on Google Classroom. Oh, okay. Thanks. Yeah, I'll upload it and then I'll post the link. Was this on Google um, Classroom, the PowerPoint? This one? You, it, so like, it's, 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 you, have, you have you have this slide. Sorry, I said the slide. You have this PDF on Google Classroom. Oh. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you, you are, it's already there. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. So I think we'll pause here a little bit. Um, let's go over. Go to the book. And then we'll try some problems. So you see how you can relate this to questions. And then we'll take a few minutes, maybe about five minutes break, and then we'll come back and do the math portion. Okay. So let's go to our book and see how best we can apply the knowledge that we've acquired today. Now you see that you can answer a lot of questions just based on what you've done today. Okay. So if you have your book, you can go through. I'll mention the pages and then we'll, you can give me the answers. Okay. okay, let's go to page 218. So now I, I want you to give me the answers. Page 218. Number three. If you are there, number three. It's science test one. Number three. Number three. It says, yeah. The spaces between neurons are called 
A, synapses. D, dendrites. C, interneurons. D, cell gaps. A, A correct. Synapses, correct, perfect. Okay. Synapses. Number four. We group of chemicals is not normally found in most living things. A, carbohydrates. B, proteins. C, silicates. D, nucleic acids. Which one is not found? C. C, correct, silicate. You know, silicate like silica, like, like glass. It, you know, okay. it needs to make Sorry, glass. can you repeat the page again? I apologize. Um, 218, 218. Thank you. Okay. All right, so let's look at this here, page 219, 219, number eight. Which of the following organelles is not normally involved in protein synthesis? Not normally involved in protein synthesis. Is it C, B? A, ribosome, B, mitochondrium, C, rough endoplasmic reticulum, D, nucleus. Think about what we did, the protein synthesis, the quick overview. B, mitochondrium. B, mitochondrium, correct. You see, it was involved. Ribosomes, remember it was RNA, the, the mRNA, tRNA, and then uh, what do you call it? The R, RNA, right? So ribosome, they are ribosomes. Uh, rough endoplasmic reticulum, we say transports the proteins. The nucleus, you need a DNA, it has a code. So the DNA, so all these are involved, said the mitochondria. So that's correct, so B, not involved. All right, good. Okay, let's look at number, page 220. Page 220. <clears throat> number 12, apply the knowledge that we've used, we've gotten today. It, it will also come up under digestion. To be absorbed by cells, proteins must be changed to A, amino acids, B, sucrose, C, fatty acids, and D, glycerol. Amino acids. Amino acids, perfect. Yes, we change to amino acids. Okay, mm -hmm. called the end product. So next time they can ask you okay. something else, you know, like a the end product of sucrose or you know those things, lactose, you know. So I want you to think about things like that, you know replace with, with the other substances. If I break down lip, a lipid, what do I get? You end up with zero and fatty acids. It's the end product of digestion. Okay, number 13. A neuron that transmits impulses from the receptors to the spinal cord is called A, modal neuron, B, associative neuron, C, an interneuron, and D, sensory neuron. Interneuron. Yeah, so it's a sensory neuron. It's from the receptors to the spinal cord. So next time they will change that and make it efferent, the efferent neuron. So you see efferent, the same as the sensory neuron. Okay. Okay. Um, let's look at the other one here. Okay, this one, use your general knowledge. Page 223, 223. Yes, use your general knowledge. Number 27. Which of these foods is a good source of protein? A, a. nuts. B, cooked oatmeal. C, honey. And then D, raisins. A. 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 A, yeah. yeah, nuts, yep. So some day you have to use your everyday knowledge things like already protein. The other ones are all carbohydrates. Right? Yeah. 28, which oxygen goes from air, sorry, I said which oxygen. When oxygen goes from air in the lungs into the blood, it does so by A, catalysis, B, B diffusion, C, active transport, D, osmosis. D, D. D. diffusion. D. Yeah, diffusion, simple diffusion. Diffusion. From high, to low, no energy involved. So it's diffusion, simple diffusion. Okay, great. Okay, let's see another one here. 
page 225. 225. Number 39. Number 39. Which of these nitrogenous bases may be found in RNA, but not in DNA? A, you're sorry. Yeah, you are so correct. <laughs> you have the answer already. You, A, you are so D, adenine, B, adenine, C, thymine, and D, guanine. So you are so correct. All right. So you see, if you know the answer, you just move fast, 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 fast. Okay, page 226. 226. Number 45. Number 45. Which diagram represents a non-polar covalent bond? Non-polar covalent bond. Okay. A, you have, you, have, you have chlorine, chlorine. You have lithium plus, and, you know, that's B, and that's C. And then B, you have H, and B, HBR, and D, and H3. A, chlorine, chlorine. Yeah, chlorine, chlorine, correct. See, so that's non-polar because because it's what on equal sharing, right? Chlorine, chlorine, equal strength, so equal sharing. So it's non-polar covalent. Like B and D are all polar covalent. You have unequal sharing there, hydrogen and bromine, nitrogen and, and hydrogen and hydrogen. Nitrogen is more powerful, and the bromine is more powerful than hydrogen. So they pull from them. Uh, C is ionic bond. When you have a plus a charge, it's like ionic. Okay, let's look at 46. Okay. You got to think through 46 a little bit. Certain seaweed accumulate iodine in a concentration as much as a million times greater than that of the surrounding ocean. How must this intake be accomplished? A, osmosis. B, diffusion. C, active transport. And D, passive transport. A, osmosis. Try again. Osmosis. Try again. Is it B? Try again. A, A. No, no, A, 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 A is, is out. Okay. Passive transport. Try again. Active transport. It's active, oh yeah. Active. active transport. You see, the key word here is it says it's concent it's already concentrated, right? But it's concentrating more. It's like taking in more, even though it's concentrated. So it's accumulating as many times, many times as that of the surrounding. So it's like, as I said, it's crowded, but the room is crowded, but then more people are getting in, you know, type of thing. So you need energy, energy involved here. Is active transport or active diffusion. Okay, good. Um, let's see another one here. Okay, go to page 232. There's something I didn't talk about, but it's a good to use that to talk about now. Which page? I'm sorry. Um, 232. 232. Number 15. I want you to give it a try first and I'll talk about it. Compounds with different molecular structures, but the same formula are called a, isomers, B, isobars, C, isotopes, and D, isotherms. Isotopes? C, isotopes. Iso. Top. Top. Okay, try again. C. 
Try again. A. It's A. Isomers. 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 Yes, isomers. Okay, let me explain this a little bit before we go on. Um, so, isomers. Like isotopes, let me make, make sure isotopes first. I should have mentioned that under uh, the atoms that we discussed. So you can look on the screen, I'm gonna write isotopes. Now, atoms, these are elements with the same atomic numbers, but different mass numbers, right? Atoms. And sometimes my pen, I don't know why it sometimes ends up, okay, it's, it's back. <laughs> I don't know what happens sometimes. Yeah. Okay, so let's say I have 16, oxygen 16, and then we also have oxygen atomic number of eight, and then mass of 18, like this. Yeah, so isotopes are atoms with the same atomic numbers, atoms with the same atomic numbers. But different masses. The atomic mass is different. Yeah. So like this, oxygen 16 and 18, like that. I can also have it is carbon, which is carbon 14, atomic number of six, and then there's carbon 12. These are all isotopes of each other. It's the same atomic number, it's different masses. In other words, they define the number of neutrons. The neutrons are different. So we can the definition can be modified to neutrons, different neutrons, number of neutrons. Those are isotopes. Now, isomers. Isomers have to do with the structural arrangement of the atoms, or the, or, or the, uh, yeah, or the elements or atoms, how they arrange. So you usually see this more in organic chemistry, right? where you have something like, let's say, I have C, carbon, carbon, carbon. Uh, let me add one more carbon, something like this, and then they will have hydrogens around it. Hydrogen all over. Okay. Now I can draw another structure. This time I'm going to play around with the position of the carbons. So I can draw one, two, three, three carbons like this, and then instead of adding the other carbon here, I'll write it down, I'll draw it in the middle here and put the hydrogens around it. Same number of hydrogens, but just different arrangements. If you count the hydrogens, realize the same, the same amount. Two different structures. So isotopes are compounds that have the same molecular formulas. Okay, so this one is C, if I put it all together, C4, four carbons, and then hydrogens times two here plus two, that is eight, 10. This again, C4, H10, if you can't, you see that it's the same thing. So they have the same formulas, but different arrangements, structural arrangements. So compounds. with the same, we use the word molecular formulas, molecular formula.
same molecular formula, but different structural arrangements. The arrangements are different. Okay. All right, so the arrangements are different. That's what uh, it means. Yeah, I'm trying to erase this, but I can. arrangements. Okay. All right, so these are isomers. Okay. Isotopes and, and isomer the differences. Okay. Isobars means same pressure, right? Pressure levels, isobars. Mm -hmm. Isotherms, same temperature uh, levels. If you look at the map, let's say if, if the temperatures are the same at those places, two different places or three different places, we say that they are the same isotherm or the same pressures, isobars, and so on. Okay. Uh, right. So here we have isomers. Okay. Can you please repeat the isobar? Uh, when you say isobar, pressure, pressure, like same pressure. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you look on the map, usually they draw lines, like some, like we call the contour lines on, on the map, and they'll show you uh, cities lying on the same curve or, or yeah, the same, maybe iso, same pressure, you know, and isobars and so on, or same temperatures. Okay, page 238. Two, three, eight. Number 38, sorry, uh, we'll leave 38, we'll do that another time. Um, number 39, 39 and 40. Which laboratory reagent turns touch blue black? A. Phenolphthalein, B, Benedict solution, C, nitric acid, and then D, Lugo solution. Which oh, one? Lugo. Ten? Yeah, Lugo, Lugo solution. Okay. So next time, maybe Benedict solution. So you think about in all the different tests. Number 40, which types of body cells are most directly involved? When a person walks uphill, A, smooth muscle cells, B, subcutaneous cells, C, striated muscle cells, and D, epithelial cells. C, striated. D, correct, striated cells. You have striated, striated muscles. So, skeletal muscles. All right, 41. When red blood coloring is added to a beaker of water, the coloring slowly spreads until the water is all colored pink. This is best explained by the process of A, peristalsis, B, diffusion, C, active transport, and D, osmosis. B, yeah, diffusion, right, from high concentration to low concentration. Page, sorry, the same page, num number 45. 45. When looking through a microscope, a student observes centrosomes in a group of cells. The cells are most likely from A, the root of a bean plant, B, leaf of a moss, 
see skin of a mouse and the stem of a fan. See skin of a mouse. Yeah, skin of a, a mouse, right? Because centrosomes mm -hmm. can only be found in Animal. animals. Yeah, those are key. Animal. Only animals. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. So far, so good. Okay, page two four one. Two four one. <coughs> Number 54. Two atoms are isotopes. If they have the same atomic number but different number of A, neutrons, B, mesons, C, electrons, and D, protons. Isotopes. Two isotopes, two atoms are isotopes if they have the same number of same atomic number, but different number of? Okay. Try again. Neutrons. Neutrons, yeah, same number of neutrons. Different, neutrons. you have different neutrons. Yeah, different neutrons. Okay, correct. So next time you can put this this way, it's the same number of protons, but different number of again, neutrons. Because remember the atomic number is the same as the number of protons. So they can insert that there. Or they can change the neutrons to mass, atomic mass. You know. If I remember the atomic mass is made up of number of protons plus number of neutrons, right? So if the atomic proton is the same, doesn't change, but then the neutrons are changing. You know, make, make the mass difference. Okay, so another one here. Um, number 56, we can try that. Usually I, I talk about that under digestion, but we can still do it. If a plain soda cracker is chewed slowly, after a while, it begins to taste more A, salty, B, sweet, C, bitter, and D, bland. Yeah, it's gonna taste sweet. It's gonna taste sweet, correct. So the, we'll talk about this under digestion. There's an enzyme in the mouth called amylase that breaks down um, starch, like it, 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 it Cracker is like starch. If you chew it slowly, the enzyme in the mouth will break it down to glucose, like simple sugars like glucose, you know. And then glucose tastes sweet. Okay. All right, 58, try 58. The first step by which a mutation may occur is a change in. So mutation can ch change something. Changes a gene, change in a gene. That's what mutation is about. So A, it says location of a nitrogen base in DNA. B, messenger RNA. Trans T, uh, C, transfer RNA. And then D, amino acid in protein synthesis. So what do you think first step will occur? Okay. Try again. See. Try again. D. Actually, it's A. It's a, it's a location of the nitrogen base in the DNA. Remember the DNA, um, we have the quotes, the amino acid, the G, A, C, and a T, right? Those are the codes. So if you change one of them within a DNA, it's going to change the sequence of the bases, and then you have like mutation occurring. Okay, change of a, a single base alone can be changed. It can change amino acid. Sometimes it doesn't change it, but sometimes it changes amino acid, and they have a different thing being produced. Okay. But the first step is mutation in the location of the nitrogen base in the DNA. Okay. okay. Um, page two forty two. Page two forty two. Number one. The diffusion of water through a semipermeable membrane is called a pinocytosis, b osmosis, c active transport, and d transpiration tension. B. The flow of water through a semi-permeable membrane. 
the keyword is semi premium bro. Do you say D or B? C. Okay, it has to be B. You remember, osmosis is a what water flows from um, hypotonic to a hypertonic solution through a semi permeable membrane. Yeah. yeah, if you remember that, I drew it like a potato cup thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So once you see semi permeable membrane, see the keyword semi permeable, always think of osmosis. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So let's see. Number, let's look at number, let's try number five. Number five, nerve impulses from the retina are transmitted to the brain by A, olfactory nerve, B, optic nerve, C, eustachian tube, and D, auditory nerve. B. B. Uh, retina. Optical. So it's B, optic, B. yeah, B, optic, optic I. Optic nerve. Optic, yeah, I, correct. All right, so I think, Okay, let me I'll give one more and then we'll one here, page 244. 244. Number 16. Which of the following will be classified as an example of connective tissue? A, striated muscle, B, epidermis, C, nerve, and D, tendon. D. Yeah, D, yeah, tendon. Connective tissue. That's why I said know some examples of connective tissues. It's a question like this. All right, then the favorite diagram, number 17. Look at number 17, the diagram. Um, the following diagram shows the endoplasmic reticulum of the cell as seen under an electron microscope. The structures labeled Z are the site of protein synthesis. Z represents A, mitochondrium, B, ribosomes, C, chromosome, and D, centrosome. B. 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 Yeah, ribosome. Yeah, All right. All right. So we are looking at a rough and the plus reticulum. Yeah. Correct. Um, the 18. The entry and exit of materials in the animal cell are regulated by which of these cell organelles? A. Nucleolus. B. Cell wall. C. Endoplasmic reticulum. And D. Plasma membrane. D. D. Cell wall. Plasma membrane. The cell membrane or plasma membrane controls substances that go in a semi-permeable. That's the key word, right? Semi-permeable. Okay, then here, this is the end product of digestion. We saw that already. Number 20, we, do, we know that already. Which of the following substances is end product of protein digestion? Amino acid, lipid, fatty acid, cholesterol. Amino acid. Amino acid, yeah. Okay, let's look at 23, and then I think we would up on that for, I think one more question somewhere here. Okay, number 23. The code of a gene is delivered to the protein producing region of a cell by A, mRNA, B, cRNA, D, DNA, and then C, DNA, and then D is ATP. So we're talking about the code of the gene is delivered to the protein producing region of a cell. So think of the protein synthesis thing that I did. Which part, will, which uh, one would deliver the protein producing region of the cell? The code of a gene. Yeah. So which a one? Hey, correct, messenger RNA. The message mm -hmm. has a message, right? The code. And that's what it, it, it gives to the R, RNA. Okay, correct. And then maybe the last one, and then we'll continue with the math. But at least it just gives an idea of some of the questions you should be thinking um, about, you know. So when you go back, you can go through all the numbers on the last column, what I should, you know, go through and you should be answer those questions. And the only one with one done acid and basis, which I'll push to next week. So anything acid and base, we'll look at that next week. Um, number 26 on page 246. It says, 
which of the following particles are nucleons? You know, then A, they say neutrons and electrons. B, electrons, protons, and neutrons. C, neutrons and protons. And D, electrons, protons, and neutrons. So what do you call the nucleons? C, D. C, right, C. The neutrons and protons form the nucleons. Okay, They are the particles in the nucleus. So C. Okay, All right. All right, so I think this is a good place to stop. Um, there's one question on the atom on page 41. If you want to look at that before we take like five minutes break. But before then, maybe page 248, number 35. You see another test question there. On 248, 35. It says, an unknown substance is boiled with Benedict solution. The brick red color that results indicates the presence of A, protein, B, acid, C, starch, and then D, glucose. Glucose. Yeah, glucose, Benedict test, brick red, purple becomes brick red when you boil it. Okay, so test for glucose, correct, okay. Um, and then 41 is on the atom. It says, a specific isotope has an atomic number of 51 and it has a mass number of 122. So the mass is 122, atomic number 51. So how many electrons are contained in a neutral atom? You have A, 51, B, 71. C, 122, and D, 173. A, A, 21. Yeah, A is correct. A, remember we said that the atomic number is the same as the number of protons and is the same as the number of electrons in the neutral, right? There is no charge. They are, they are the same. Protons, atomic mass, electrons, same, meaning a neutral. If there's a charge on it, then it's gonna charge, it's gonna change. You know, that's when you're going to either add or subtract, it depends on the charge. Okay, so here the same, 51 atomic number, because you deal with a neutral atom, neutral. Okay, all right, great. You know, so the, I think we can keep going and going and going, you know, but at least I believe I've stimulated you enough with some of the questions to be thinking about, you know. So based on this lesson, there are a lot of questions that you can answer um, today you know, from the book and any other questions that they ask you, you know. Um, so I think we'll, let's take uh, like five minutes break, right? So it's now 12.15. Let's come back um, 12.20 um, so that we can begin the math part. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. So take a five minutes break. We'll, All right, let's go back to page 104. Of the sign? Um, page 104, math. Okay. Yeah, we're going to do the math part now. So for the math, as I said, we're going to go through the exercises um, sequentially. So we'll start with test one, we'll go through that. And then if there's any particular area that uh, we are having difficulty, then I'll stress on those areas. You know, instead of teaching um, the particular concept and coming back to the book. So we'll go from question to question. So we're going to vary the concept as we go on. You know. 
So page 104, try number one to number four, <laughs> right? One, two, three. Now remember a lot of the things on the test, most of the things that you're gonna see on the test, one of them, there'll be a lot of proportion. Proportion will come up a lot. So we'll look at proportion. And then we'll also look at um, a lot of fractions, like if operations of fractions. Those are some of the areas we should be looking at. Operations on fractions. Okay. And then also decimals too. But proportion will form a big chunk. If you know proportion, you can do a lot of things. So you can use a proportion for percentage problems. Percentages. You look at that aspect as well. Mm -hmm. Because these are things that you need for um, working out your next medication problems. That's why they try to test you a lot on these areas. You know, then you have some algebra, like very basic algebra concepts. So we'll look at some of these areas as we go on. My chunk will fall under proportion. So number one, two, three, four, you should be able to do them. Try them yourself and then we'll discuss together in about three minutes. Okay. And you're allowed to use a calculator. So you can use your calculator to do the basic calculator, not the, the complex ones. So number Okay, for number one, I believe everybody had that. What do you get? So, a, number two, a. Should be a, you had A, right? Yes. Okay. So, that one is straightforward. So, we'll skip that one. Um, number two. D80. Number two, we had 80. Okay, so 80 here. Okay, how did you do that one? Um, for that, what I did was I did four times 20 and I got 80. 
Okay. Um, I'm asking this question because I was wondering whether you use proportion or not. Uh, so there's, so they were asking 20 times in 15 seconds, but they want to know for a minute. And yeah. so I did 50, uh, 60 divided by 15, which I got four and then four oh. times 20. Okay. All right. I mean, that's good. So at least use, use proportion men and mentally. You know, that's what you did, like mental proportion, which is good. So I sometimes tell people, use anything that you want to use to help you, kind of general, general math knowledge. Some people just think through, say, okay, there are 15, uh, four 15s in one minute, you know, 15 seconds in one minute, you know, and then they multiply the 20 by four. And so, mm -hmm. so whatever you can do to help you <laughs> do that, all right, that's great. Um, but I like to use this question to introduce the proportion, like just to review proportion. Since it's going to come up, proportion is going to come up a lot. Okay. Um, so if you have something like this and you want to use proportion, then you set the problem up like this. So say 20 bits. So you can say 20 bits in 15 seconds. So that'll be the ratio. Because that, that's what is given. This pair that. Then you can set up a second ratio. So it'll be equal to. They set a second ratio. Again, we set a second ratio, it means that it should match. If I have bit per second, I should also have the same thing on this side, same bit per second here. Bit over second. They should match like this. Okay. If you do that, you never go wrong. Um, how many, what do I want? I don't know the number of bits. So I can use a variable X unknown for this, All right? And then, since this is one minute, I need to change to seconds. So that means that one minute have 60 seconds. So this will be 60. Okay, so that's a proportion if you're using proportional approach. What I want to stress here is the fact that the units, what you have here, the ratio, the unit that you have there should match. Beats per second, you should have the same beats per second here. And then you never go wrong with this. Then you do your cross products proportion to cross product. So 15 times X, so it's 15 X is equal to 20 by 60. Okay, then you can divide by 15 so that the X will be left by itself and divide the other side by 15, both sides by 15. You know. Then you can use your calculator or if you want to reduce to lowest terms without calculator, then 15 to itself is one, 15 to 60, is four, then four times that's 80, you know. Or I can just multiply 20 by 60 and divide by 15. Okay. So this is proportion approach, you know. So at least to introduce proportion, <coughs> this is a good question to begin with. You know? You know? And I, I believe you all remember proportion, proportion very well. You know? If you're not too um, conversant with that, please review that. Again, it's, it's going to help you a lot in most problems that we're going to see. So I've been mentioning proportion a lot, proportion, 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 several times. All right. You know, but other than that, if I see this question, I'll just do it quickly in my mind. You know, how many 15 seconds do I have for that times that? Okay. All right, good. Okay, number three. Number three should also be fairly easy to do. D. D, correct. Um, if you have any question, what we're doing, please alert us so that we can pause and go over for you to understand. Okay. So here you can use your calculator since you're allowed to use it, you know. But if you're not allowed to use it, they have to multiply the numbers without the decimal points. Then you're going to count the decimal uh, number of decimal places that you have, and then you're going to move the points to that location. That's without the calculator. Does somebody want us to do this without calculator for you to see? I have a question. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, why is it D not C? Because the last digit is less than five. If you are uh, running C. Okay, let's, let's do it together again. Okay. Let's do it together and see. So three, 
one six times six o nine. So you have this times that, that's 56, so that's four. So I'm multiplying without the, uh, I'm doing it without the calculator. So I, I forget about the decimal point first. All right, then I'll multiply and then count at the end. So four, that's 54, right? 54, five left, five times, nine times one is nine plus five. So that'll be another four, 14, one left, nine times, Three is 27 plus one, so that's 28. Then zero, so I have to shift it and right here, zero, zero, zero. Six times that, that's 36, so that'll be six here, three left. Six times one is six plus three, that's nine. And then six times three. Six, okay, what's happening? Okay. All right, so what do I get to? So six times, I said I'm here, right? Six times six plus, that's nine. So six times three, that's 18. So you have four. Four here, four there. This is four. This is one. Right, so this is nine, and then this one is one. Did I do the right thing? Four, four, what did I miss here? Nine, six, four, nine, six, one, six. Should be 19. So this is nine, nine times, that's what, nine times four, that's, that's five left. Nine times that, that's four, 14, one left, 27, that's okay, zero, zero. This is, so here, this should be two. This is two. So one, nine, two, four. Okay, so that's my place, so one, two, three, four, four places, so one, two, three, Four move on end, so it's, it's 19.24. Yeah, it's 19.24. So it's C, not D. C, yeah. yeah, thank you. Let's see. It's 19.24. <clears throat> All right, so we have to check well. All right, so number uh, 14, number four. Number four is does um, fractions. So we're gonna use that question to review fractions. Okay. So remember when you're working with fractions, let's talk about addition and subtraction of fractions. Addition and subtraction. In addition and subtraction fraction, you always need LCD, very important. The least common denominator, LCD, very important to remember that, okay. So in this question, since I'm subtracting, I need the LCD, so five over 12. So what's gonna be an LCD in this case? The least common denominator, 12 and three. That's gonna be 12, right, 12. So it means that you write each fraction as an equivalent fraction with denominator of 12. So let's write a six. I want to write this with 12. And then when I come to the two, two thirds, I want to write that also with a denominator of 12, a common denominator, right? So you're gonna ask yourself, what happened here? How did I get 12 to 12? It's times one. So since it's times one, I have to multiply the numerator also by, let's say by one, by one. So one times, you multiply this by, this is times one to get a 12. So I multiply this also by one. 
So this becomes it still stays at five. Now this is originally three. Now it became 12. So it means I have to multiply this by four to get this 12. Whatever I do the denominator, do the same thing to the numerator, also four. So this now becomes eight. All right. So once the once you have the equivalent fractions, now we can add. Add the whole numbers. So you have eight whole numbers. Add the fractional part, which is the numerators. So five plus five, sorry, five. We are subtracting. No, 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 yeah. I'm subtracting, not adding. So we are subtracting. So since we are subtracting, I have to subtract the numerator. So five minus eight, it will give me a negative number, right? You get a negative number, which is not good because we can borrow from this whole number. If there's no whole number there, then that's fine. You know, but this is too small. So I can make it bigger. How can I make it bigger? I have to borrow. So please look at what I'm doing here. I'm gonna borrow one from the six, one whole number. So it means I'll be left with five whole numbers, right? But the one that I borrowed, if I borrow one, that one that I borrowed, it's in terms of the denominator. It's always in terms of denominator, right? So the one I borrowed is, I'm taking 12 parts out of the whole 12 parts. That's the same as one, right? So it's 12 out of 12 parts. If I take all, I've taken one whole. So I'm gonna add this 12 parts to the five. So I'm gonna add, get 17 parts out of 12, all right? So I've created a bigger fraction out of this then minus the two eight over 12. Now I can subtract five minus two, that is three, and then 17 minus eight. And then that gives us um, nine over 12. Okay. But I can still reduce to lowest terms, this fraction here. So I'm gonna end up with three whole number, three into nine is three, three here is four. So you have three, three fourths. That's our answer here. Okay. So this is a borrowing approach. You know, I know some people will change this to improper fraction, and then at the end they'll change back again and so on. You know, that is too long. It's too long. You know, it may be okay for this problem, but there are some problems you're gonna have two, two or three steps that you have to work out. You know, then in that case, you're wasting your time if you have to go through the improper fraction uh, method. You know, so if you can get used to what I did here, the borrowing is gonna help you move faster you know, in, in a lot of problems. Okay. Anybody has issue with this type of borrowing? Borrow for the whole number, whatever you borrow is always intense on denominator. Um, can you if, make if, another that? Say that again. Can you make another example for that? Okay, um, I'll make another one. Thank you. Let's say that um, I have seven, let's look a smaller number, maybe two fifths minus probably three. And uh, let's make it, uh, what number should I use here? Maybe one half, like that. Okay. So Please again, you have to subtract this. Does someone have a question? Yes, me, Chris. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Hi. So for the final product, three um, whole number and then nine over 12, yeah. aren't we supposed to like divide it with the same, whatever's in the top with whatever's at the bottom? So if we're dividing it to make, to simplify yes. the, um, the answer, shouldn't it be like three and one fourth, not three and three fourths? Three into nine is three, correct? If you divide three into nine, that is three. And I divide three into 12. Yeah, you're right. Sorry, I'm confused. Ah, yeah, thanks. you got it. Okay, good, <laughs> good, yeah. Okay, so here I have to write, um, LCD here is going to be what, 10, correct? So let's write 10 as I denominate one. The, we got five and two, the common, least common denominator is 10. Five can go into that, two can go into that, the smallest number. <clears throat> so what happened to this five to become 10? This is times two, right? So this is times two to get 10 here. So I multiply this also by two. So it means that I have four here. This is times 
five to get a 10. So whatever I do with the numerator, denominator, I should do the same denominator. So I have to multiply it by five. So this becomes five, okay? But then four minus five is going to be a negative number. What else I can borrow from the whole number? There's a whole number to borrow from. So I have to borrow. So I'm going to go to a seven and, and borrow one from the seven. So I'll have six whole numbers left. Now the one that I borrowed, that one that I borrowed, what is that equivalent to? Now the denominator tells me the number of parts, right? So I have 10 parts. The LCD is 10 parts. If I have 10 parts, how can I can I get one? I have to take all the 10 parts, 10 out of 10, all the 10 parts. If I take all, I get 10 out of 10, all right? So always the one that I borrow is in 10, so the denominator, if this is 12, there is 12 out of 12. If it is four, it's four out of four. That is the one, okay? So what do I do? Now these 10 parts, I have to add it to the half four over 10, four over 10. So I'm gonna combine the two. So I get 14 parts out of 10, <coughs> after the 10 parts. So I add the 10 parts, that are one of 10 out of 10, add the 10 to the four, I get 14 out of 10. So I have a bigger fraction that I can now use, okay? So now I can subtract six minus three is three. Four, 14 minus five is nine. How did, how did you get Say again. How did you get six again? I borrowed one from the seven, right? So I have six whole numbers left. If I take one of the seven whole numbers, we have six whole numbers. Correct. Yes. Did you get it? I'm a little confused because I do a different process, but this one. Is oh, if I borrow one from seven, how many parts? How many whole numbers do you have? Six whole numbers left. How, You're taking how you one. Get, how you right. Get, mm -hmm. How did you get fourteen? Okay, that's what I explained here. I have seven whole numbers. So if I take one out of the seven, I take this one out of seven, I have six whole numbers left, six whole. That's the six, right? Now the one that I took out of the seven, that one whole, what is that equivalent to? I'm dealing with 10 parts. If I have 10 parts of something, let's say this is, let's say this is 10 parts. If I take the whole 10, 10 out of the 10 parts, that is one, correct? Yes. Yes or no? Yes. Yeah. So 10 out of 10. So that 10 out of 10, I'm adding it to the four parts, 10 parts to four parts. So I get 14 parts in all out of the 10 parts. So I have four parts, let's say four parts, one, two, three, four. Four out of maybe 10, the whole of this is 10. And I have another 10 out of 10 parts before this is 10. So I put these two together out of the 10 parts. So it's 14 out of 10. Make sense now? Yeah. Yeah, so I'm going to do a lot of, like most problems like this. Uh, because it helps you work faster when you have multiple steps. And you're going to see that along the line where you have multiple steps, you can, you, you, it wastes your time changing proper fraction, changing back again, and so on. Mixed number, so it, it's going to be a little messy in some questions. All right, so at least this is an introduction to the borrowing. How you borrow from a whole number. It's always in terms of the denominator, the, what you're dealing with. If, it, if it's four, it's four out of four. If it's 10, 10 out of 10, that's a one whole. 12 out of 12 and so on. All right, so let's try at number five. Try number five in, in a minute. Yeah. 
if you have the answer, you can tell us. Is it D? D. Okay, I think so. Let's see. So here you can use proportion, right? So the American Diabetes Association estimates that one in 20 people will be diabetic at some time during their lives. So I can write that as a ratio, one in 20. Okay. When you hear that, you can write as a ratio, everyone diabetic out of 20 people, one in 20 ratio. So if I have a ratio, I can always come up with a proportion by setting up another ratio equal to another ratio, they have a proportion. So I need to have a, di a diabetes here or a diabetic person, and then the people should be here. The units should match. Okay. So what is missing here? So in a city of 120 people, so I have the number of people, so this 120,000 people. That's the number of people here. How many do you expect to be diabetic? We don't know, so I can put X. So you set up your proportion nicely. And then you can use your cross product. So here we have 20 times X, which is 20 X is equal to 120,000 times one. So that's 120,000 times one. Then you divide by 20, both sides by 20 to get X by itself. And then you have your six, Let's see what I have 20 here. 20, so X will be equal to, can cross out the zeros or can use a calculator. Two here is one, two here will be 6,000. So you should have 6,000. So there are 6,000 people. Okay, so the answer should be B. <laughs> so that's a proportion that approach. Okay. okay, good. So we see another proportion, how to use proportion. It's gonna come up a lot in programs. Proportion, proportion, proportion. So I tell people when you're taking the exam, if you are stuck, just remember me, proportion can help you in a lot of problems. Okay, number six. Number six should be easy. 0 0.15. We want to write this as um, a fraction. So what should I do here? So here, you have two decimal places, right? So two decimal places means out of 100 parts. So this is a 10th, 10th column, the 100th column. So it's 15 okay. out of 100, two zeros, two decimal places. It's 100, 1500. Okay. And then you can reduce this to lower steps. Okay, five can go into 15 three times, and then five into 20, into 10, into 100, sorry, into 100, that would be. Uh, 20, so it's three over 20. Okay. So that's 15 out of 100. Okay. Now for number seven, they are this is a system of equations, right? System of equations. Now to solve system of equations, we can, there are different ways of solving system of equations. You can use the elimination method, you can use a uh, substitution, you can use graphing and so many other things. You know, but you don't want to waste your time and bring all that here, right? You can do what we call back solving. You can, you can use a back solving approach to do this problem. So you choose the answer, you choose one of the answers and then you plug in and see if it's going to be true for both um, equations, okay? 
So this is what I recommend that you do. I create something like a table quickly to use. And then 6x minus 5y is equal to 40. All right, so I'll do a quick back solving. So I go to the answers, and then I'll see which one is possible. You know, x is given, y is given. So I've, let's do the first 10 and 4, 14. Sorry, 10 and 4. So let's see if it works out for both. So if I go to the first one, 10, I have 40 times 10 plus 4 times 3. This 3y. Three it's too big, right? It's not going to give 14. It's too large. 40, that's too large. So automatically, I'm not going to script that time. I'm, I'll script that off quickly. You know, when I look at the next one, 8 and 26, y is 26. Look at it again. It's not too big. Y times 3 times 26 is a big number. And you're adding it to another 4 times. So it's not good. So B, automatically, it's not good. You know, so it's between C and D. You can narrow down quickly. C and D. So 5, 5 and 2. Let's try 5 and 2. 4 times 5 plus 3 times 2. Would that, gives me, would that give me, uh, what do you call it? 14. So this is 20. And then this gives 6. So I don't get 14. Right? 26. So this is not equal. So this is not equal. So it means this is also not good. So automatically, the answer should be D. You know, just for curiosity's, curiosity's sake, Let's check and see. So four times five plus three times negative two, would that give us 14? 20 minus six, that is 14. So that is correct, it checks out. This should obviously be true for the second equation. So whatever you get for the first one should be correct. There are some problems, if you do this, it will correct for the first one, but I may be wrong for the second one. So it's always good to check both equations to make sure it's satisfying. Okay, so if I check here, we said I'm gonna check. I mean, we know the answer for this, so it's obvious. But let's just try. This times five minus five times negative two. Would I give a 40? This is 30. This is positive 10, 40. So that also checks out. Okay. So it satisfies both yeah. equations. Yeah. So you can use the back solving approach to do this, eliminate the big, big ones, and then we can narrow down. Okay. Other than that, they have to use either as a substitution or elimination method. You know. but most of the time, these answers are given, so we just work backwards. OK, what about number eight? Number eight, again, number eight, you can use proportion. If you're stuck, proportion can help you. Number eight. If you get the answer, you can just tell us. One milligram to zero point zero zero one. Gram. This is the proportion. Is it eight? Which one do you get? A. A. You say A. Yeah, I said A. Yeah. Yeah, it's A. Correct. Because you have to divide by. Uh, by thousand. Or you, yeah. Thousand. Or, yeah, or you get, three. Or you multiply by the correct. Yeah. All right, so if, 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 those who are, if you are stuck, you can use proportion, as, as I said. If the ratio is given to you, one milligram is equal to 0 0.001. So you can write it like this. Set up another ratio, milligram to gram. You need a milligram. So the other dimension is a gram. So X, you don't know. you know. And then if you do cross product, X will be equal to 256 times your zero point. I'll use the dots as a multiplication. So this times 0 0.001, okay? And then you have 0 0.256 grams, yep. 
Or if you remember your, your conversion very well, gram is a bigger unit than the milligram. So it means that since you expect a smaller number, you have to divide by 1,000. 1,000 milligrams is one gram. You can, you can go back to conversion, uh, basis of conversion as well to do that. Okay. Okay. Um, so let's let's round up on number nine and ten so that we, to be a whole uh, like next time we can we can continue from the next page. Okay. So let's look at number nine. At least today will be the foundation for next week for the month. We'll do more next week. Okay. Number nine. Say one half of x. One half. Uh, of x. So one half, you can write it like this, is equal to 64. Okay, one half of x, one half x equals 64. Okay. Then it says, then one eighth of x is equal to, but we, so it means that we need to know the x first. Okay. So again, this will be introduction of um, algebra, right? Introduction of algebra. If you have a fraction, always get rid of the fraction. You get rid of fraction by multiplying by the reciprocal or that fraction, right? So to get rid of the one half, it means I have to multiply this by two, right? Whatever I do the left side, I do the same to the right side. You multiply the right side also by two. So we have to multiply this also by two. See both sides by two. Okay. Or if you're confused, make it two over one. So then you know what to cross out. You know, two over one, and then this will cross out. So we we'll end up with X here is equal to uh, one, two, eight, 128, right? But the question is saying, find one eighth of the X, one eighth of the X. So we know X, so we have to now multiply by one eighth, one over eight. So one eighth of X, one over eight, it means times of x. So my pen is acting up again here. <clears throat> I don't know why it's slow to respond today. Okay, so, so someone should check one eighth of that for us. This one eighth times, so this times one, two, eight. Okay, so eight into that, that is one. And then, so it should be 16, right? 16, 16. yeah, 16. Okay, so that's how you, you do this. So remember to get rid of fractions by multiplying by the reciprocal, you know, okay. And then number 10 should be easy now. Another proportion, it's a proportion. So a penicillin solution contains 300,000 units in one ml. So 300,000 in one ml, that's a ratio, all right? That's a ratio, okay? So 300,000 Okay, you figure that out right now. Let's see. Pause after I get this pen to respond. It's delaying. I don't know why it's delaying today. Technology. So 300,000 units for in one ml of solution, right? So set at the same ratio on the other side. So this time I have 60,000 units. So it should match units and then ML should be here. That is missing. You want to find a solution in milliliters. Okay. So once you do that and cross product, then we know that this is going to be 300 thousand x is equal to sixty thousand 
and then divide both sides by the 300,000. You have X left here, and then you can reduce the zeros. Since the answer is in fractions, you have to maintain these also in fractions, right? So you can cross out the zeros. We have four zeros to cross out. So all these zeros, we can get rid of them. Four of these, we we'll get rid of four of this. So we end up with six over 30, which you can reduce to lowest terms again. Six over 30, reduced to lowest terms. Six is one, six into that is five. So the answer will be one over five ml. So that is a proportion question. No. Great. So I think this would be um, a good point to stop for today.